minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. You are now tapped into the coolest reptile podcast in the world. Welcome to Trap Talk Reptile Podcast, episode 383. Tree Monitor Tuesdays! Oh my God, am I excited. What up, everyone? If this is your first time tapping in, I'm your boy, MJ. Hope everyone's having a glorious Tuesday out there. Do me a favor. Why don't we just go ahead and hit that like button if you've been watching this podcast and you really enjoy it. And if you're excited for this episode, smash that like button, okay? Hit that subscribe button. And if you're wondering, how can I subscribe to this channel? I don't get it. It's called gmail sign up on gmail it's a free uh account that you could sign up through gmail once you sign up through gmail it allows you to sign in through youtube and then from there you could actually subscribe to the channel for anybody out there who just can't figure it out just letting you know that's how that's how it works okay i want to say from the bottom of my heart thank you for all the love and support ongoing love and support thank you to all my patreon members first and foremost if you're looking for exclusive content if you want to tap in with an amazing community of trappers longevity keepers ones who are all about evolving and learning and people that you could definitely build relationships with join the trap talk patreon family you're not gonna you're not gonna uh be disappointed i'll tell you that much shout out to my trappers all right love you guys but very first link you see in description below you click on it Join the Trap Talk Patreon family. Then after you join the Patreon family, you get a link to the Discord, which will tap you in with over 170 trappers. We have an amazing Instagram uh, group chat going on that cracks off every day. We're just all about winning, okay? So thank you to all my Patreon members. I love you guys. See you at the top. And yeah, tap in with us, all right? Also, guys, this new segment is all about my new craze with the tree monitors. Been going kind of ape shit lately within the last year, just wanting to learn more and more. And I know I have certain segments throughout the week that I like to bring to you guys, but I'm now officially going to be bringing a tree monitor talk segment at least every other week. Every other Tuesday, you will have a tree monitor Tuesday episode, and I'm going to be bringing only the best in the tree monitor game. That's it. None of this fucking beginner shit. No, I don't give a fuck. I only want top elite motherfuckers that I fuck with to come on this segment. So you guys are in for a treat because two of my favorite are tapping in with us tonight, and it's going to be amazing uh, what, what, what we're going to be uh, – talking about tonight fuck, what am i talking about either way do me a favor a uh, shout out to tonight's sponsor which is ridiculous racks my boy doug shout out to all my homie doug killing it in the large lychee game the, the giant lychee game is his bread and butter but also works with amazing speed uh, with other amazing species of geckos all right so head over to instagram type in ridiculous racks and that's r-h-a-c-s you perverts all right tap in with doug see what he has going on let him know that MJ from The Trap sent you. And just be ready, man. This guy's killing it. Been killing it. Appreciate your support, Doug. Uh, yeah, and I just love seeing what you're doing, man. I also want to say that tonight's episode is brought to you by Clutch. All right? Amazing organization app if you're in the Ball Python game. But that's it for now. Just Ball Pythons, unfortunately. You know, I don't even know why I even brought that up. I'm so sorry. But either way, I love Clutch. And if you're in the Ball Python game, shout out to uh, Justin. Um, you know, shout out to the entire Clutch team really next level type shit when it comes to wanting to become organized when breeding reptiles, AKA just ball pythons for right now. But thank you, Justin. Appreciate the love and support. Last but not least, tonight's episode is brought to you by Sim Container because that's what I have my one tree monitor egg in. Again, here we are with one tree monitor egg, but it's on day 132. We'll be talking about that too. I'm very nervous, excited, but nervous. Don't want to come into another fucking situation like I did last time but it could ha could happen so it is what it is either way if you got eggs put them inside of a sim box less steps less stress if it's a sim it's a win all day every day john alex appreciate your guys's uh pff, ongoing 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 support my very first sponsor ever right here and they they've always rode with me man so thank you so much john and alex and my favorite monitor people in the game for sure all right these are my mentors when it comes to wanting to know what I got to do to get dialed in with my laces and whatnot. But guys, the thing about Sim Container, they got their hands dabbled in with so many different species of monitors. You could really geek out over it. So head over to Instagram. Go give them a follow. 
sim container thank you so much all right Woo! who's ready to go i'm ready to rock and roll i'm very excited shout to early birds you know i didn't shout to early birds last time and you know lately i haven't been and i'm going to now let's go miller's menagerie in the building trap talk patreon member all day every day appreciate your support justin campbell in the building what is good trap talk patreon member all day every day heath and hatchery in the building trap talk patreon member all day every day Dong dongs hey yo dongs exotic <laughs> that's a sick name sort of dong that's all all i hear is dropping dongs uh ricky bobby srt my dog right here shane above all scales on instagram go, go give him a follow um trap talk patreon member all day every day that's my dog big mike 1776 exotics trap talk patreon member all day every day Susie from ship your reptiles which by the way you got a reptiles use ship your reptiles take 15 bucks off that next shipment use promo code trap talk suzy thank you so much for being here uh you know i just want to say suzy's a real one she's also part of the trap talk patreon family this girl's like my big sis man so thank you so much for all your love and support suzy you're a real one and yeah let's catch up soon um scale fins and feathers my boy josh Somebody I'm very proud to call a homie who's kind of local to me. He's like a couple hours away from me. But, man, he's also tapped in with the tree monitors. He's been successful at breeding Persinuses. And you know what? I'm so happy that my boy Josh is doing so well that we're going to end this. In Actually, hold on. I take that back. I love you, Josh. But I saw someone else I really, really like in the live chats. And we're going to end it with Parker's Park. That's my dog right here. Parker's Park is so player. Okay? Uh, go give him a follow on Instagram. This kid has nothing but brightness coming in his future. I got to tell you, it's cool to see the youth working so hands-on with shit that I love, and I'm fucking old. But Parker's Park, go give him a follow on Instagram. I lied. We're ending it in big, 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 big time style. The mayor of Condro Town. Is he lost? Probably not. Maybe he wants to own a tree monitor someday. Maybe. Who knows? He's the fucking mayor. Can't wait to see you soon, Bill. And, Bill, I called you today. Call me back tomorrow. I love you. Guys, it is time to go. It's time to get ready to rock and roll. Do what you got to do to get your mind right. Do what you got to do to stay hydrated, okay? But it is Tree Monitor Tuesdays. The very first Tree Monitor Tuesdays coming at you right now with my boy Cody and my homie Brian Susan. Get that last name right. Susan. See you guys at the top. Let's go. Yes. You ready to do, do more in the future? Trap yes. Talk Podcasters? Yes. Man. Holy. Only trap talk, exclusive. Yes, exclusive. exclusive. <laughs> oh. So stop calling us. Rub the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the crop, gotta love it, love it, and not them. Hop from the hop to the rub the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the rub the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the rub the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the rub the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the Everybody, we do it. Everybody, we do it. Rub the club, hit the spot. There we are. My guys, episode 383. What is good? Brian and Cody in the building. What's up, guys? Yo. What's good, players? How are we doing? See you, Cody. Yo, what's up, Brian? <sighs> Cody's, been, hey, Cody's been on a sick one lately, bro. Yeah. Did you see that shit? You see uh, oh, those you know, babies. Five, yeah. five of them? Yeah, awesome. five of them. Yeah, they're all crazy social. Dude, it's... It's kind of a problem. It, it blessing and a curse. If I go in there to feed any of them, they yeah. will like climb the track and get on top of the enclosure and try to like jump into my head and shit. And I did. I'm scared. I'm gonna lose one. <laughs> I mean, Cody, that's my exact. I, I, before we went live, I was giving mad respect to Cody's moves, and what I mean by that, just like his patience. He, you know, on Facebook, from what I've seen, I, I see you on Instagram, but I see you put a lot of the stuff on Facebook where you socialize just simply by putting your arm out, letting them get comfortable. And I, mm. I love, I, I 
more comfortable doing them with the bigger ones the smaller ones man like the black trees that i got they're very bold they come straight to the they'll come straight to the window and i'm like i almost have to like push them away because they want to come out so bad but right man, dude they they launch out they'll like and, and they're so small i i'm just scared it was going to get in a crevice or something that's over and once mm-hmm. that happens it's so i i do fear about these little fuckers getting on the floor and taking off um, oh yeah but, I, but from what I've seen, though, when they hit the ground, they you kind of have like a split second to get them. Yeah, like before have, they realize what happened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm noticing yeah. like once they hit the ground, they're kind of like, all right, what's what do we do now? And then they take off. So it's like you got to hurry up and uh, get to it. And, and Brian, I've seen you work with all your tree monitors almost on the same level. Once they're out, you know, did, did, have you ever had a problem catching one, Brian, or, or getting one back? No. What, what kind of floors do you have? I have uh, vinyl or no laminate, laminate for it. The wood yeah. floors and they just sit there and sputter. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 yeah. You have something like that, then you're, you're, you're good. You get an extra like second or two because they spin mm-hmm. out. But <clears throat> yeah. No. What do you have? Um, I have actually, it's an, uh, an epoxied, it's an epoxy layer on top of concrete. So I've got a slab and I do this metallic epoxy on top of it. And um, it's great. I just wanted something that's easy to clean, you know. Mm-hmm. Right. So is, did they get a little bit of more grip on something like that. Is what you're saying? No, no they don't. No, the epoxy's yeah. slick, man. So they run in play. If, you, if you go in there with Crocs and there's a little bit of water, it's a disaster for a wipeout for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit, man. Yeah, I've almost done the splits before. Just uh-huh. I think I think it's because my sandals were kind of worn out or something. I was working too fast and I hit like a little wet spot. And I fucking, I damn near did the splits, and that shit almost put me out, bro. Have any guys, any guys almost gotten hurt working in your snake or in your in your room? Mm-hmm. <laughs> From that exactly, mm-hmm. dude. Holy shit. Um, but okay, guys, <clears throat> want to get into things uh, first and foremost. Thanks for being here for all of us tonight. Um, I have nothing but craziness going on with the tree monitors lately, as far as my, you know, excitement to want to learn more about them. And, you know, I, you know, have a, an egg as you both of you guys know that's on day 132. So just excited to have you guys here. Um, Cody, I want to kind of get into like your game plan right off the bat with your recent litter or recent clutch of Persinuses. Um, You're a big believer on getting these things locked in socially straight from the beginning, right? Like, is that oh yeah part of your, your, your recipe as far as working with them? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I will say too, like not, I, I don't think it's for everybody. It It's a lot of time required, like early on. And, uh, you know, it's nice, I guess, having them be my only ones consistently going that I can actually dedicate that time. Because um, if I was, you know, producing on somebody else's level, like mm-hmm. probably what, like what Brian's doing, I don't know if I'd have the time to put in all those hours with it. But I'm very hands-on that first few days. Very hands-on. Um, yeah. And like out of the out of the sim container, um, like I I just kind of open the lid, I crack it, and I I hold my hand up to the corner of the lid, and right. they'll they'll sit there and spin and like run in circles around it, and they'll eventually figure out where my hands at and come out to me, and I'm just oh. real slow with them, and I just walk them hand over hand until they calm down, and five minutes of that, and they're just they're good, they're chill. It's it's pretty quick how fast they go from batshit crazy to chill. And then after that, it's just trying to be present in the enclosure a lot the first few days, uh, just so like if my hand goes over them or anything, they don't care. Hey guys, before we kind of continue things, don't be shy. Don't be shy with the super chats. If you have an important question or something you want to get out there, do what Bill just did. Drop a super <clears> chat. I <throat> will stop the topic to ask the question. Uh, <laughs> Bill, Brian, why'd you get out of Condros? <laughs> I mean, I'm still in them. <clears throat> I just am not. Uh, I'm not in them as deep as I used to be. Um, I held back a bunch of the babies that I produced, um, from those clutches a couple of years back. So <clears throat> I'm raising them up, so, but yeah, Bill, I'd love to get something from you just so I can have some out, something to outcross my stuff to, but I've only got like 1.2 right now of adults and then my babies. So, um, yeah, any chondro heads out there and you've got something cool. I'd love to get, just, I don't even care what, what sex it is. Dude, same. I, I, I've been obsessively following garrick uh house of blue dude i want some of his stuff so bad it is insane um i i think i'm sitting on shit what do we have like 3.4 3.5 of chondros right now and or or sorry i said that backwards like 5.3 because we kept buying females and they turn out to be males 
Mm. Yeah, I'll, that's cool though. I mean, at least you got a nice little group. <clears throat> yeah. How many, how many neonates are you? Bill, no, Brian. I was just gonna say, Bill. I didn't really. I wouldn't know if I did any amazing work with Condros back in the day. I had an amazing collection, but <laughs> by the time I got stuff up to breeding age, I mean, I had lost a handful of, of pairings, just like first time females, and that was kind of before we knew about the whole Nido thing. Mm -hmm. and so I kind of like, yeah, I kind of caught the brunt of all that back in the day and um, just kind of, I, I stepped back. I kept a couple things um, mm -hmm. and I just kind of went full into geckos to kind of get reignited back into herpetoculture. And um, so geckos kind of reignited me and then, but yeah, I still got some lying around, but I didn't, I definitely wasn't like cranking out babies or doing anything insane back then you know so mm -hmm. well i mean come on I, appreciate like the love. I was in the i was in the forums and i was around right i was I, I went over to maxwell's house when i was really young and like was checking out his collection drooling over it and you know all all the i was on like original chondro web when i was in college and i don't want to age myself but i'm about damn to turn, <laughs> about to turn 41 in october so i will say brian's Brian's being very humble right now because I've seen the productions he's made, and I I will die a happy man if I make shit like that. I'm I'm really okay with just getting to that point. So we you, work. Side you, you probably produced more chondros than I have at this point, MJ. So that means I've killed more then too. So thanks. <laughs> it's all good though, man. It's uh, it, it's it's the it's I don't know. Like no matter what the chondro game would ever put me through, I would always need to keep them. Like at least one or or a handful. You know, maybe. If I ever got wiped out, I don't know if I would ever take it to this point again because that kind of shit does scare you. Like it's kind of like, what the fuck? Like, what yeah. the fuck just happened? And, and but like, chondros is something where I don't, no matter what I'm doing with animals, I need the chondro <laughs> in my life. You know what I mean? That's I'm obsessed with them, just like the tree monitors. I would say I, I look at tree monitors almost the same as chondros, but even better because tree monitors, you know, they they fucking know you're there. Like I don't know, it's just it's different. It's a monitor. We're talking monitor versus snakes, right? And this is why. Even even snakes in general put me to sleep more than a monitor will, and I, I will say any any snake because at the at the end of the day you're only going to do so much with the snake, right? I mean, you need to get some spilotes. There. No, I'm good, bro. I like the tree monitors. I'm sorry, I I spilotes is uh, oh you're oh you're talking the the tiger rats. You need I, to get a, I, yeah. Uh, I do not need to do it. Eastern Indigos, I'm telling no, you, or mark on. No, no way. We're gonna be cleaning Blue shit. Print. Yeah, dude. Yeah, that'll be most yeah. of your work with them is cleaning shit off the walls. Oh, yeah, are just bored with snakes. You need to do tiger rat snake, especially like if you were to get a Tamalipas locality from Jason Hood. I, I think he just sold his pair. Um, I'm a bitch. I'm a bitch when it comes to those, but those things, those things literally in, in, intimidate me, bro. Like they snake on the planet. Yeah. My favorites are the Eastern Indigos, even if they do Picasso shit everywhere. I love them. I used to work with them at a, at a facility up in Illinois. My, uh, nice. The curator up there had a bunch, but man, yeah, they're awesome. It's the type of snake I'd love to see in the wild. But mm. keeping them, like, there's certain things I love and would just, you know, enjoy seeing in the wild, but keeping them, it's just too much work. My, my first experience with them was going to a Herp Society meeting that was held mm. at the college here with the herpetology professor and this was you know seven years ago something like that and he pulls this female out of an enclosure and he goes here you go watch her tail she might drop babies in your pocket <laughs> and she was like gravid gravid wow. so yeah that was a cool experience I've, I've wanted to keep them ever since i just keep doing other shit instead <laughs> so you, so getting back on tree monitors real quick you guys um both know the situation at hand as far as what happened with my egg that went to like day 141 and then it kind of like it pipped because i saw like i saw slices in oh, the yeah. egg and then as i observed the egg i could tell there was no life in the egg and then i went ahead and went in there and i saw what almost seemed to be a fully developed tree monitor but the belly was just completely wide open like just mm -hmm. all right um You've dealt with that before, right, Brian? I think you told me that, that that's something you've seen or dealt with before, or, or, or no, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I almost feel like, you know, do you have, what, what was the history on that female that you got out of curiosity? Like, where did she go? She got, she was import. She came from Joe Switalski. Was um, she little when you got her? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay, yeah. I mean, like, my first blue clutches I had, they were, like, infertile. Then I had a clutch that was going the distance and, like, 
sure enough, it pipped. I'm like, oh my gosh. And the thing hatched out and it was like kind of like what you're talking about. I mean, it, it died right when it came out of the egg, but it had like kind of a similar thing where it didn't develop properly. Um, and then after that, they just started nailing it. So, so long as your animals are kind of cycling um, and you're getting eggs, you're getting fertile eggs, obviously, you got to just stick with it, you know? Yeah, so definitely. Bad, and, and, I feel like, and then it just gets better. Yeah. And, and, and I'm very lucky to see that things are like, you know, once I separate them out and put them back in, I'm seeing things are going as they should, you know, like, you know, <laughs> hunger increase. And then he's, you know, he's locking her and then going through the motions. Now I'll tell you this right now, you know, Cody, you told me like on the dot 90 days or 91 days since prior lane. That's what mine are typically right. with just with the greens. So um, just through talking to people, um, it, it definitely seems like, I mean, a like maybe a conditioning thing. So where you're just kind of getting them in the in the swing of it and making a habit of it. But also like I'm sure there's some genetics that play into it. Like maybe some females are more predisposed predisposition to cycle more often where others will only do it two, three times a year. Maybe some are more equipped to do it three, four times a year, but then maybe some like that, like with my female, you mm -hmm. know, where she was cycling every 90 days, she's cycling every 90 days, but she was only laying three eggs at a time. Now that she's like six years old coming up on, she's laying five eggs every time, which is, which is nice, but it took her five years to get there. So wow. it's, Yep. How old was she when you got her out of curiosity? And has she put uh, more size? She was just under a year old, I believe. So somebody got her as like a very, very fresh import hatchling. Um, they had her for six, seven months and then sold her to me. Um, so my my assumption was I got her around 10 months old, somewhere in that area. Um, when did you first pair her up? Or did you keep her with the male right off the uh, bat? she was kept alone until she was about a year and a half, a little over a year and a half old. And then this was my other thing too, was I, I think I somehow like stimulated a cycle on her too soon. And that maybe like stunted her um, because we paired her up with a male, like just under two years old. And she was, she's pretty small anyway, I think, but she was like significantly smaller than she cycled. She had two eggs only both duds. Um, Four months later, two more eggs, duds. Three months after that, two eggs, one fertile, went the distance, pipped, and died. So same thing you guys are talking about. It wasn't like deformed or anything. It was it was like fully intact. It was just scrawny, and it was like underdeveloped. Um, I think it needed like another 15, 20 days based on the size of it. Um, and based on like my incubator too, now they, they usually pip at like 157. This was like 142 days. So, um, but yeah, and then since then she's been laying three eggs every 90 days and it would be like all three fertile or one infertile. Um, and then she started laying four eggs about a year and a half ago. And so then I was hatching three consistently and now finally getting up to the, to the five mark. Now I got to ask you, Cody, um, from your experience, like, like when you have like so for instance like i had my very first tree monitor clutch this year on on Jan <laughs> january 4th right mm -hmm. and that's when you're talking like yeah for me it's typically 90 days is when that next one drops but she dropped that next one for me on 427 which is a little bit more than 90 days but like kind of in that range right i don't think there's anything wrong with that just yeah, but, maybe maybe the food was a little bit different or something but here yeah. we are this here we are this time and i've had them paired up since i believe uh june uh -huh. Okay, and there was action in the beginning, and her just eating, nothing happened, and here we are, like, still, uh, September fifth, uh -huh. and she's big. She, I feel like she's about to ovulate now. Uh -huh. Um, but is, is that weird to be off that cycle, like to be that far? Like, could it just be like that anytime? Could it randomly be any moment when she could go again, or is it supposed to be like scheduled? I'm, I'm just curious. I think it could be at any moment. It's just like depending on what the the stimulating factor is. Like, it, right. if you're, you know, like there there's the the factor of like it's been hot as all fuck this summer. Yeah, it's been hot. So exactly. it's really hot. If, so maybe that's if what you're not. Doing. If you're not feeding way more to compensate, then it's probably been harder for her to start to cycle. So then you're kind of battling the heat. Yeah, I'm battling the heat, but dude, she she's a fat ass, bro. She eats. Mm -hmm. like, she fucking eats and um 
And it was almost like, you know, all right, whoa, dude, like you're eating a lot. Like what's going right. on? So I'm just like, and I was told like, she wants to eat, you fucking feed her. So I'm like, and, and, and but is there, is there a moment where you just chill? Like, or is there like, if she just keeps chowing food, should I chill on the food for a little bit to kick something going? Or what, what do you, what, what do you guys think? Um, me personally, what I do, um, is, you know, if I, I, I will basically like, I, I have like a median level that I feed them and then I will ramp off of that, uh, to a higher volume, uh, when I want to stimulate a cycle. And if I'm at that like higher volume for a month and a half and I see nothing, I see no swelling or hanging. Um, I will typically at that point just do one of two things. I either cut them back and I cut the heat off. And I just stop feeding her as much. And then I try to cold cycle him. Or I will call my vet and have him come do an ultrasound just so I can see if anything's happening. Ooh, so make sure she's not egg bound or something is what you're saying. Oh, not even that. I just want to know if she's building follicles. Because okay. if I'm feeding for that long and there's no follicles, then I know what I'm doing is kind of pointless. But if I have him come out and I see she has, you know, four follicles at nine millimeters, then I'm like, okay, something's happening. I just need to stay on course. So that, that's kind of what I go off of. I, I ultrasound a lot. Like when I'm when I'm trying to get shit done, um, like with that cordensis that I, actually you saw her, Brian, that cordensis that I picked up at Tinley. Mm -hmm. um, I got her to lay uh, two months after Tinley. Um, and I was, I was having my vet come out and do ultrasounds every other week just so we could track the follicle growth. So I knew I wasn't wasting. That's the animal it. that was going to Brandon? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I I got five. Did she lay? Because I thought she didn't end up laying for you. She laid uh, four eggs, and they were all duds. Mm -hmm. She dropped them in a fucking cork tube this big around on the wall, and it was cold. And they were they were like gecko eggs, dude. They were they were tiny. Why she lay them there? Who fucking knows? She dumped them because infertile. I'm guessing. I gave her two different cork tube lay boxes. Uh, one or sorry, I gave her two different lay boxes. One was the cork tube, and then one was like the traditional tub. Right. And she went into both of them, came back out, never went back in, and then just scattered uh one of the eggs, and then dumped the other three in a cork tube, like a small one. And you'll find that I think Brian, you told me you or I think it was Brandon who just had a female that never fucking lays right. She just yep. lays how she wants to lay, and and I feel like that's something that is. You got to deal with that with time to time with certain females. Like no matter what you have dialed in for nesting, they just don't like it. I don't know. Is that true? Or, or, or is that something that you need to continue to fucking figure out and see why it is that they're laying like this? What do you guys think? I think you need to definitely try different options. Um, you know, no female is the same of any species. You can think you have figured out. I mean, <clears throat> this season I've had four different pairs successfully laying, consistently cycling. Um, actually, I take that back. Six different species because I've got two Cordo pairs that are going now that I have fertile yeah. eggs from. Um, <clears throat> but every one is different. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think kind of I'm working on a, a pretty cool nest box prototype um, with, uh, with animal plastics. Nice, uh, nice. With Nick over there, that I think is going to be pretty awesome. Um, he kind of laid the the groundwork, the foundation for it, and um, kind of was sending some prototypes over for me to test out with different females. Um, and I'm using one of them currently that's with a female that has kind of scattered a couple clutches now. She hasn't liked her nest box, um, but I think there's a few, you know, there's a handful of different things that you can do to make them more comfortable. But again, every female, you know, it's easy to have a pair going and you think you've got it figured out. And then, you know, you pull other pairs together and then it's like, well, wait a second, why aren't they doing the same thing as that one? Mm -hmm. And I kind of got a taste of that with, with my yellow pair, a, a different yellow pair that I have who, um, you know, has, has been very tricky. I had her with a couple different males. She's only given me infertile eggs. And, you know, just recently she's been digging, but in the past never used your nest box. So I think there's different things to figure out, you know, and, and, and having your substrate off in your nest box, that can be a trigger. The heat, mm -hmm. that can be a trigger. The location, that could be. The male being in there still, that could be. So, so many variables. A lot of things that I think people overlook um, mm -hmm. that uh, just contribute to, you know, 
poor clutches and, and mm -hmm. uh, or no clutches at all. I think there's a lot of people out there too who have pairs of tree monitors and they're the same gender and they don't even know it. Yep. <laughs> I think that is a huge. I think that is the amount of like missexed animals that I have seen yeah. like, is crazy and like in addition to that i just think that that's like a major reason why people have struggled in breeding them i really do but that's yep. also that's also like regardless if you have missed sex stuff which i feel like especially if you're getting imports what the fuck do you expect you're not going to get anything right. confirmed right but that's kind of on the keeper to either find a vet or find someone to help them to get the actual sexes down yeah. right like isn't there a way and, and to also to be clear too like i i'm i'm guilty of that too like i have mm -hmm. had I sold a, a buddy of mine, an animal that, you know, I thought for sure was a female and it ended up going, you know, male later on. And we rectified that, but, um, but still, they can be very tricky when young. And I, I don't like to sex, like guarantee sex on any animals that are under like seven to eight months of age. And anybody who does like confidently, I, I, I'm very cautious with that just because of what I've seen personally um so it's yeah it can be i don't know it's tricky mm -hmm. yeah with my with my greens i will usually say like hey i think there's a good chance this is going to turn out to be male or female based on the head shape and because yeah. my male and female are so different and i've just produced so many from these but i still won't say definitively hey this is going to turn out this because mm -hmm. it's so fucking young it's hard to say yeah, I mean, throughout time, it's kind of, I don't want to say obvious, but these kind of signs with head structure, it started, it, it, it never becomes a, a, an no. obvious thing. No, man. Head not structure. Even green, not even with green. Not, green. Yeah, like, whatever. I Like, for me, head structure is not a thing unless the animal's over two years old. Right. Right. Okay. But you're looking at a young animal and they're talking head structure. Yeah, no way. No. Nope. For me, for me, my, my perspective is, um, for blacks, yellows, blues, absolutely not. I won't even try to say. Specifically, the one that I think that I have a good idea with it is greens only. And even then, if it's a small head and, you know, like a blunted face, you can usually say female. But if it's a big head, that could be a female with a big head. Yeah. So I it's think that's very confusing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally. And it doesn't hold true. And I've shown I've shown animals like people who have who have talked about the whole head size thing to me. I've shown them pictures of animals and said, just out of curiosity, what do you think this is? Mm -hmm. Knowing well, knowing what it is, um, like the whole blunt face thing, I I just I don't buy it at all because I've, mm -hmm. I've I had I have females that have extremely long faces. Exactly. Yeah, and that's why I say if it's a long <laughs> face, I can't say either way. If it's yeah. short, I could probably say it's a female. But if it's long, it's it, there's not even a point in trying. Once they get older, well, again, like once they're like once you have a mature male, sure, then you can mm -hmm. look at that head and it's like yeah. But, but usually their heads are like animals, bulkier it's... anyway, not just longer. Right, but I'm just talking like straight head size. You know, when you mm -hmm. get to younger animals, it's just it's too confusing. But, but adults, yeah. different story, right? Pardon me. But adults would be a different story. Like you could, right. you could that that head structure uh, type of talk that we're talking would matter if we're talking like adults that we're looking at, right? Hey, you I, can also look at a male's. You know, you can look at a male's vent, and you can see the division at the base of the tail for mm -hmm. the bulge. You're looking for the bulge, right? Isn't there a bulge you're looking for? Correct. Right. Mm, um, hey, I, di I did want to ask anyway. I never even touched face with you on it. Uh, what did that green that I I sent you end up being? I was going to ask. I was going to mention something about that. What did yeah. you? I forget what you told I, me. I'm literally going back in our, in our messages to see what I what I predicted it was. I'm very. Um, I, yeah. I mean, I think you I'm here, it was going to be a male, right? I think that's what I said was I thought it was going to be a male. I think I'm, I'm going back to look. Um, I, I can say that's what um, I remember too. Okay. Uh, of the ones that I've sold. You ready I've, for the gender reveal? Yeah. Uh -oh. Let's hear it. The results are in. Well, no, you know what? I don't even want to say for sure, because again, I like to, I like to chill out, but like, you know, know again, and, and never jump the gun, but I ended right. up getting, um, a couple of animals from two unrelated pairings from Brian Whitehead. Uh -huh. He produced a couple of greens. So I have three greens, one of which is from you. And then I have one each or two from Brian. 
uh, from two, he has two different pairings. And um, I will say that at this size, um, one of them that I have from Brian is obviously a male and it's very similar age to yours. Uh-huh. I, I think I'm, you know, again, I'll double check and I can post it tomorrow on my page um, if I'm wrong, but I'm almost positive that yours is a female. Nice. Okay. Hey, well, uh, I need because the I other ones that I got from Brian are males. Right. Um, I'm trying to, I'm still trying to see if I can find the message. Like I said, I think I said male too. Um, but I, I can at least say of the ones that I, that I've sold, I try to keep track of and go back and ask. And most of the time I've ended up being right. I think I'm like 80, 20 split on being right on guessing the sex. And it's more, it's not even the, the, the shape or the size of the head. It's more so the females, my females noses curl like this and the males noses are straighter. And that's, that's Mm -hmm. more so what I look for is like, just like the shape of the face. And I've been right most of the time. Obviously I can't say every time, but. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I got a, I have a super chat question. I want to ask real quick. Shout out to homie John who, uh, had a great success with, uh, some sort of species of skinks. Remind me, John, if I don't remember, I'm so sorry, but, uh, his uh, question wanted to know, he wanted to know if there's uh, any possibility of these tree monitors doing a double clutch. And I guess that's like a clutch right after a clutch, like dropping a clutch and then dropping another one right after that. Is that, is that, is that anything that you guys dealt with or know of anyone dealing with before? I've not. I, I've heard people say it. I've never seen evidence of it. I've never seen it personally. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, the, so the idea is double clutching is like, it, it's they're not I, I had somebody ask me the question the other day so i'm, I'm kind of fresh on this <laughs> um double clutching would be essentially where she lays eggs and then just with retained sperm fertilizes more eggs that instantly start development and they never lock again and so then it's like eggs and then 30 days later more eggs or wow. some shit so I, I've never heard of that with tree monitors. I've heard of it with other species. Just nothing like it's a that. common thing with colubrids. But I yeah. don't. It would take. I, I just. I would be interested to see any documentation on that because mm-hmm. I think what what can happen that might be confusing to people is if they have, for instance, I've had a female who wasn't good eggs, but she laid part of her clutch at one point, and then it was a matter of like. A couple weeks later, she had picked out some additional eggs that she just had not gotten out. Um, mm-hmm. so I could see how someone could be confused and think that was a double clutch, but it's not. Right. Yeah, I guess it happened with him with Kimberly's. Okay. I mean, Aussie monitors, they can crank. Um, yeah. I guess, I don't know. I'm not saying it's impossible. I think the ones that I've actually heard of it with were lace too, so just oh. back in your... Yeah, I was I was gonna assume if that were to happen to honor, they'd probably get burnt out really quick. Like that probably like that's something you definitely want to like be you know mindful of if that were to happen, you know. Yeah. And there's a lot, there's a lot we don't know too. I mean, there's a lot of stuff like I I don't know. I'm sitting over here like very anxiously waiting on a specific egg to hatch from an animal that I got um that a guy had for a year, and it was a cordo pair he had they were both females um he didn't know it at the time they were also pretty small and he got them from someone who you know only had those two together um you know i don't even know if he kept them together but either way there's a span of at least two years um where the animal had not been exposed to any male it's so because of that it's very interesting because i ended up getting a clutch from the animal very shortly after I got it from my friend Jason. So he was the second person to get this female cordo. Had not been paired to anything. A few years before that, who knows? Um, I believe it was an imported animal. So there could have been something in the history beyond that that is unknown. So it's either going to be a case of parthogenesis or it's going to be um, a situation of potential retained sperm. Um, I'm not going to ever have a definitive answer on it. Maybe it dies in the egg. We don't know. But if it does hatch, um, it could be pretty novel for the species. I mean, parthogenesis and retained sperm is something that we see 
with different species of reptiles. So it's not like it would be completely earth shattering, but it would still be pretty amazing. And to my knowledge has not been documented in tree monitors, again, that I've heard um, for sure has not been documented with cordensis. So mm -hmm. if it hatches, if, and it's healthy, um, it's either one of those two things. And I think each of them are pretty amazing. Um, right. So let's we'll see what happens. What day is it on? I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to go check, um, but it's close. It's very close. Uh, imagine, imagine having that many tree monitor eggs. You don't, just don't. Yeah, sorry, I don't have that number for you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I want that problem. <laughs> I could tell you the fucking shade of white that this egg is right now if I wanted to. You know what I mean? I'm just obsessed over it. Um, I, getting back to egg talk, though, you know, I, I want to say shout out to my my my, my uncle Mike, big uncle uh, Mike Stefani, Mike monitors. Um, he was somebody I shared that photo of that green tree that had the stomach wide open. And, and at first he didn't take a glance, but he was like, oh, and he's like, oh, nephew, I could have showed you how to save that animal. I could have showed you a technique to cut. And I'm like, ah, this thing was already dead, Uncle Mike. He's like, oh, I didn't see that. But I wanted to know what he really meant by that. Um, and I'm only asking this because I know Cody, um, we spoke about if there was ever a time for you needed, you needed to cut an egg, you will cut an egg, Correct. It totally depends. It's, it's very situational. I've done it. I, at this point, I, I try to not, I will most of the time wait. Like if it's basically the situation is if, you know, there, I have a clutch of four, three of them hatch. One is still just sitting there, you know, four or five days later and the egg is super dented and nothing's happening. Then I'll cut it. If it's not dented, if it's, if it's, um, you know, just a plump egg, I'll just leave it um so but, super, yeah. super case by case yeah very case by case but like i i've found when you get eggs that are really denting and like the bottom side of the egg will like have like a thumbprint in the bottom of it like yeah, 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 yeah. up from the bottom yeah. um if it's like that it's pretty close to like on its way out the door it seems for me i've cut them like that and had them survive and then i've had others where i didn't cut and they died so that's why I started cutting those ones specifically. But I, I usually recommend against it. And I, I will never say, hey, cut this egg because I don't want that on my conscience if somebody kills a fucking animal. So I'm, I'm right. like, hey, make your own decision. Do you? Yeah, it's super like, I guess, dicey because it's like, man, this is all new. And like, just because I've done it in this situation doesn't mean it's guaranteed for you. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But you, you told me this before, too, Cody, that the denting from the bottom isn't good, right? Like that, there shouldn't be any denting from the bottom or, or is that kind of normal? I'm curious. Uh, a small amount. I, I definitely play with my eggs more than I should. <laughs> so, do you, do you explain that? What do you mean you play with your eggs? Uh, I just like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I don't know. I get, I get flack for it a lot, like picking them up and inspecting them. I try to not anymore, but my first couple clutches, I was just really curious what's going on. Cause this is literally the first, reptile i've ever produced so um so I, I just wanted to be hands-on and see what the hell's going on um so you'd pick the egg up and like kind of like maybe put a candle over it and just kind of see what's going on in there that's what you would yeah do? i used to a lot yeah and like like every 60 days i'd candle it or something and like close to the end of incubation i'd like lift it up and look underneath of it and right. i i had one where it was super super dented on the bottom and I sent a picture of it to Matt Cosman and Nick Gill. And I'm like, what do you think is wrong with this? Do you think this is fine? And they both said unanimously, that thing's going to die in the egg. And I left it. And three days later, the egg started to mold. And I cut it open. And it was well dead in the egg. Um, next pretty, time pretty it happened. Formed, pretty formed? It was pretty like developed or not really? It, it was a little underdeveloped. It was like... I, like it was the one that I was saying earlier that I was like, it probably was 15, 20 days from mm. properly formed and hatching. Mm. Um, but the next time I had that same instance, I cut it right away and it, it wasn't so underdeveloped. So maybe it was, it was a totally different circumstance, but I cut it the next time around and it lived and it was fine. So I just, I put them on wet paper towel if they have a bunch of egg yolk and I um, keep them in a tub in the incubator for a day and, and then uh, I do what Mike Stefani showed in that video and like twist the yolk up and snip it off and throw them in the cage. <laughs> yeah. Um, Brian, is there, or, you know, Brian, you know, with breeding chondros, a lot of breeders like to do something for like the last 10 days, bring down the temps, 
uh, create some air holes and whatnot. Um, is, are, are you doing anything like that with your tree monitorings? I am. <clears throat> um, I have ventilation in them from day one. Um, so, I mean, everybody, everybody does it different, but I, I currently have not had any issues with eggs, you know, drying out. Like normally when you have stuff denting, like severely early on, that's a sign that it's, that there's not enough, um, humidity in there, yeah. in there. So, um, and, and what's crazy is I know like Brandon had mentioned, um, that he'll have, a, you know, it's not uncommon for his to dent. Most of mine don't dent. Um, they stay pretty firm until they come flying out. Um, so I haven't experienced that with those, but like from geckos and stuff, sometimes I get lazy and I'm putting eggs in like old incubation containers and I've lost some eggs from that. Um, what state are you in, Brian? Um, yeah, I can't disclose that. North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the humidity like out there? Like your natural humidity? Um, it's pretty humid. It's okay. pretty humid. I mean, I, I feel like that's a big factor. Yeah, I mean, we get a lot of rain, but even still, like, my rooms are climate controlled. So I've Yeah, that's fair. Rooms de dedicated to different species. And so in my tree monitor rooms, I have, you know, mini splits that are in there that I'm keeping it at certain temperatures just in the room. And then in addition to that, I'm doing their own, like, little micro habitat. Gotcha. Yeah. Stage. Yeah, I, I think that's one of, like, my issues why I saw so much denting is because, A, I'm in fucking nebraska in the winter is just miserably dry here uh -huh. and then be my house i i don't regulate the humidity in my house well so i just spray my cages more often mm -hmm. so i feel like that's why i saw more denting and kind of like brandon has said like denting towards the end but every clutch and and this is kind of my my proof of concept of that every clutch that i've had hatch in the middle of the summer did not dent before it hatched mm -hmm. but in the winter they do dent a little bit Interesting. Looks like somebody's bopping in on the comments. Like, uh, I think Eddie yeah. brought, brought Aaron in and said that there is a, a, a double clutch in there that he that he observed that. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be curious, Aaron, if you could also mention what um, how many eggs you got in each clutch. It looks like it was 14 weeks apart. Um, what is that? But, so that wouldn't be double clutching, but that would definitely be like retention or partho. But I, I mean, people would argue not partho just because no. it's been with a male. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I could see that being like retention for sure. I just want to give this guy props. That's cool. That's, cool. This guy's That's outdoors, very cool. This guy's outdoors enclosures are fucking so sick. And, and if you ever want to talk about doing things outside right, this guy <laughs> Really has shit down, and I want to say I'm a huge fan of your work, Aaron. Damn, Six and that's five. good numbers, dude. Yeah. Holy shit! Oh. Six for the first and five for the second. Wow. Fuck yeah, it's impressive. Yeah, that's awesome. No, that's that, that's very cool. I wish I had that luck. <laughs> now, mind you, do you think it's because where he's at, like where where his what his climate's at, and how he's able to do things where he's at? You think? Maybe? Who fucking knows, dude? You know, I, I won't say anything on that one. I don't have a clue. Yeah. Shit. Now, I mean, going back to like, you know, as far as fully development goes in the incubator, um, around well, what wait a second. So how many months is that? So you're saying fourteen, 14 weeks. weeks. So, so yeah, that's that's three and a half months. Okay. So that's not necessarily a double clutch then. Yeah, that's what I was saying. That that wouldn't be a double clutch, but because that's a longer time frame than my female takes apart in her normal clutches. Yeah, because you're ninety days, like you said. Yeah. Right? Yeah, 90 days is pretty, you know, it's anywhere between three to four months. I mean, I've had them up to two months after they've laid a clutch. That's um, quick. I personally, when I think of double clutching, I think of like, yeah, um, I, I think of colubrids and I, and I don't, I don't even, I don't even breed colubrids. So I don't know the time frame from when a clutch is laid right. to the next would come out. So if anybody out there has that information chime in but i think we might be getting caught up in like definitions of what of double clutches because yeah. oh yeah for sure agreed i i think it would fall under basically eggs are laid and there's already follicles growing for a second clutch and then they just instantly get fertilized yeah he said there was no pairing though either so okay. that's what that's what he meant there was no lots or anything. I gotcha. yeah I but but that's what i was saying would be like just retention i i guess yeah you could maybe argue that that would be a double clutch because no pairing i don't know i guess everybody has a different definition of what that term means when i hear double clutch i think it means back to back like quick succession mm -hmm. but no either way that's fucking awesome yeah, yeah they, they cool. don't have enough they don't have enough greens down there tree monitors in general so glad mm -hmm. somebody's doing it well cool 
Sweet. Well, that's the, yeah, that's awesome. And now, John's mentioning about the Aussie stuff. I know like some of those Aussies, if you're feeding them enough, they can crank every month. Um, mm -hmm. as much as, um, the and, shortest time frame I've had between eggs and then second clutch was 78 days. I think was the fastest turnaround I've had. Mm -hmm. I, think I heard that saying before. I forgot who told me this, but in the monitor world, there's a saying, keep them hot, feed them a lot. And that's, mm -hmm. What's Dude, what? I, I used to hear Mike Stefani and oh, fucking everybody just heat them and feed them. Heat them <laughs> and feed them. I like that That's one. Because <laughs> they get the question, how do I breed these? Heat them and feed them. Heat them and feed them. <laughs> uh, I, I have a question, Cody. You know, going back to your, uh, you know, you ultrasounding um, your females quite often. Mm -hmm. um, just to, just to, to, to confirm, if you were to have your vet come over, you were to ultrasound, you saw no egg development, whatever, that's when you're going to go ahead and cut back the heat and kind of recycle. I'm going to change something. Something. So, yeah. As something has to change because what I'm doing isn't working. Now, so. like for instance, like if we were, if we were to dial down the heat, how long would you do that for? Usually until I see something. <laughs> well, you're saying, uh, so, what, do you, what do you start seeing building? And that's when you're like, oh shit, I'm going to crank the heat back. Yeah. Up. So like if nothing was happening, I might completely stop feeding him. Like it's, I might feed the female once a week and cut her light hours down to, you know, seven, eight hours a day and dial their heat way back. And then uh, after three, four weeks, ultrasound her again. And most times there's follicles. And then. At that point, I might leave it another week or two, or I might crank it up and just start feeding her like crazy again. But what I don't want to do is feed a female into obesity and then keep feeding her and keep feeding her with nothing happening and then just kill her from morbid obesity. So it, as soon as they hit like a certain um, body like structure, like build, as soon as they hit a certain build where they look like just to a certain point of being fat, I, I cut it out. That's where I'm at right now because right now I'm like, okay, is she gonna ovulate or is she just gonna look fat? Because right now she just looks, like she looks rounded, but not like rounded, rounded. Like you know how they look right, cool, like they're fucking straight, goddamn around, <laughs> around when they're ready to go. It's none of that. She just looks fucking big. You know Usually, what I, mean? what I look for is that like indentation down the spine that carries onto the tail. If that's like super prominent, I'm like, all right, you're pretty fat. I'm cutting you back. Okay. So, um, now speaking of fat. Uh, and we're gonna team up on Brian here, Cody. Hope you're ready, because <laughs> you know we we we. I don't know about you, Brian, but we, me and Cody and I, we we, we breed grasshoppers, buddy. We're we're <laughs> we're pretty heavy into the grasshoppers. You got them right, Brian. Yeah, 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 yeah I thought so. Like we talked him. about it a couple he times. Doesn't, he doesn't like them. He doesn't like them for some reason. I never said that. I never They're said hard, that. man. They're <laughs> hard. They're pain in the ass. In my mouth. I have them. Um, I just have not. Like my collection is, I don't have enough production of grasshoppers to sustain my entire collection. Right. Not a very yeah. large collection. I wish I could. I wish I could help you because I have so much. <laughs> I I'm in a transition period where I'm kind of like shifting things around, and I have a new room that is like mm -hmm. dedicated to my monitors, and so that's going to open up space to really. I'm going to really kind of double down and focus on um, just all insect breeding in general. So. That'll change, you know. I think they're great. I think they're great. I wish I was producing more of them, but I've just kind of I've had a lot going on multiple fronts, and so there's some projects that have suffered, and breeding insects has been one of them. Yeah, but to talk on that, Cody. I mean, how how do you feel about the overall diet in a grasshopper, especially the homegrown ones, the ones that you know what you're feeding them and you know what's going in them? If you're at that level when it comes to a, a superior insect diet like that. Do you need to implement anything else you think, or, or, or I'm just curious on, on so, how great of a grasshopper diet is. I, I think grasshoppers are great for food. I think they're great if you could figure out how to make them a staple in their diet. Cause it's like, like just speaking naturally, it's the most natural thing for them to eat that in cat it is. Um, right. It's not a cricket. You know, right. Um, I, I think the most beneficial part of grasshoppers, which a lot of people that are just coming up trying to breed them aren't implementing and I'm not even doing it yet. Just I, I sent you my new setup. I have like nine fucking cages on a baker's rack. Um, I'm about to install um, UV lights across e each rack because uh, grasshoppers being diurnal 
as opposed to nocturnal, they can actually convert um, UV light into D3 and calcium, which nocturnal bugs can't do. So it's one of the huge benefits of feeding grasshoppers is if you're providing them natural light or UV light, they're just going to naturally have um, more nutritional value for the animal. And I think that's um, why my shit's going crazy because my mine are outside. So mine are every, oh yeah, getting natural sun and and, and obviously I could get away with that because where I live. Mm -hmm. uh, but Must man, be nice dude. <laughs> it's fucking, uh, and it's also not that big of a deal. If one gets out, I go up. See you later. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's natural here. Fuck it. <laughs> I used to. Yeah. I remember I was so like, man, because Kai was like, shout out to my boy Kai, and and I want to say that's my grasshopper mentor right there. But fuck, bro. Like, there have been times where I was literally chasing a grasshopper because how important that one grasshopper was. <laughs> like, I'm like, no, I have six left. Fuck that. And I'm chasing mm -hmm. it around, bro. Like, oh, but now I'm like, if fuck, if 10 could get out, I don't give a fuck. Like, there's right. so, I don't want 10 to get out. I don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying, like, holy shit. Like, they are just, they are just thriving right now. And, yeah. And, and mind you, man, like, these big, when they get big, like, we're like full, full grown, dude, my yeah, three, like, that's, okay. Yeah, dude, those are even Huge, fun. Dude. Those are even fun for my lace monitors. You should yeah. see my lace monitors go crazy. Now, mind you, they can eat like a hundred of them, so it's like, you know. Mm -hmm. but, but it's cool to see that kind of like healthy activity of the hunts. And, and bro, the tree monitor, the baby, the the uh, bakaris that the bakaris that I have, bro, that's their number one thing are the grasshoppers. Like they, oh yeah, they go nuts. Like I'm talking, and I, dude, I could give them a good size one, and they will tear it apart. Like they will like. Mm -hmm claw it and rip it and i'm like oh this is gnarly and um and so i'm just kind of paying attention to that i'm like dude they fucking love these man yeah yeah the uh kind of my my main purpose to starting them was just reading hey this is what tree monitors usually eat right. and uh over the last year i've basically dialed it back to where like i really I honestly don't feed them to my adults much anymore just to try to continuously grow my adult groups Mm -hmm. um the main time i'm feeding them off is like right now i have hatchlings that's the only thing i feed them right now so when you see all the uh, little green ones coming <laughs> all the yeah way. yeah yeah but dude they eat like the like the medium going on large size ones even at a week old but um yeah I, i'm holding them all back for them um i sell some but i i just do it local i don't like shipping them it's a pain in the ass now the males are smaller, right? Like the yeah. Males so for the species smart. that you have, the males are a bit smaller. Um, I have that species and an, another one called Americana. Right. Those they're all like this size, the male included. Right. Um. Th those just you can't get on the west coast, but um. No, they're they're great. Uh, they're just a pain in the ass. They which they take up more. Of, which are more productive for you, Cody? Uh, the, the Nightons for sure. The gray birds, um, which is the ones that MJ has. I, I personally prefer the Americana more. Um, they produce slightly less, but, um, they, they don't seem to eat as much either. And, and they're just like a little bit easier to care for. I think, I don't know. I prefer them. The males are bigger. They're not quite as psychos. I just think those are way better. You said Americana, but, Americana. What is the, what is the one that you like? Americana. Now, they're, 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 those you had those at Tinley, right? Or didn't you yeah, have like I have those at Tinley? Yeah. And you're like, like, you can't you can't ship them, unfortunately, or something like that. Or, or uh... I can, I just don't like to. Right. It's a headache. It's I just be... don't like to. I I personally, um, for me, it's just hey, if you want grasshoppers, hit up Kai. If you're local to me, or Dude. if I'm gonna be at an expo with you, hit me up there. I yeah. usually just refer people to Kai. Yeah, hit up Kai, guys. I'm serious, man. If you really want to get your hands dabbled in with the grasshoppers, and and if you want to. Make sure you're getting good information. Nobody's nobody out there could beat Kai. I feel like in my mm -hmm. personal opinion. So, um, but you know, when it comes to your guys' baby's uh, feeding schedule, like if you have a newborn, um, and I know with the laces, I was feeding them every day. Like diversity, I was switching it up, but every day they were eating. Is that the same thing with the tree monitors? Should we be offering food, some sort of some sort of uh, food to them every single day, or 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 no? Go ahead, Brian. <clears throat> um, I don't. It's not to say that you can't, um, you know, a lot of them will take it, but I do every other day pretty much with all of my animals. Mm -hmm. And um, especially with like, I know Cody was mentioning something about feeding his females earlier and kind of worrying about obesity, but I feel like the only ones that I really worry about obesity with are my males. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a female that's cycling, I feel like, you know, especially if you're shooting for production, you really can't feed them enough. 
Um, mm -hmm. But even then, I don't feed my females every day when that's happening. So the yeah. babies, <clears throat> everybody's every other day, and I start all my babies out on crickets. So even yeah. even even during that building stage, and, and she's getting close to ovulation or whatever, like during that time where you should be offering more, you still don't feed every day. It's still every other day. I don't do every day. No, I do yeah. every other day. I I, you can I agree with that. Feeding size, you know, like again, if I look at a male and he's big, even if it's like feeding day, I'd be like, yeah, I'm not going to feed you today. Yeah. The main reason I I didn't say I worry about males with obesity is because I literally feed my males like twice a week, mm -hmm. um, and I just feed them slightly larger quantity, but I feed them bugs only. Uh, yeah. So they get grasshoppers or dubia. That's it. Sometimes okay. I will give them the occasional quail. I do not give them rodents. I don't give them any of that. Um, so I, I don't really worry about the males too much with obesity, but kind of like you were saying, if they're cycling, you can't really f feed them too much. My issue is I have a female that, uh, it's my, my black tree female. She, uh, I, I was feeding her, um, typically I do every third day. And then when I'm trying to cycle, I'll do every other day. Um, and I'm just slamming her with food every other day and nothing and she just got super fat no follicle growth nothing and yeah. so that's when i dialed her back and i'm just going to give her time to lose some weight and then try again because i don't want to just keep if you're not breeding a female that's a different story yeah i'm trying to but <laughs> she's yeah. laid for me once she's just not doing anything right now so like the male has no interest is what you're saying or there's no action going on what, what, what? uh i i actually four days ago had my vet out and ultrasounded her after three four weeks of like way increased food intake and she's just started to look fat rather than like she's cycling. Right. Right. Um, and so I had my vet come out and he said, yeah, her follicles are like two millimeters. And I'm assuming that's not the start of something. That's probably just like what they're at. And so mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, that's, that's my sign that it's just not going anywhere. I'll try again in a couple months. Like when, you know, it starts to cool off here and, a month and a half or so when it starts getting really cold she'll probably cycle then naturally so and you'll pull that you'll, you'll pull that mail for that couple months right i'll leave him you'll leave but, him yeah he's fine okay some of them i pull him some of them i leave him it, it really depends on the animal some of the males are really easy going and they won't bother the females all the time so i'll leave them is egg not preferred to a, a breeder male like should you not feed an, a male egg is that too fatty you think or is that okay i'll think so like, I mean, obviously, if it's like, okay, here, here's an egg this week, good job, you know, or something like that, yeah. that, that that's okay, right? I, I think it's fine. What do, you, what do you think on that, Brian? I, um, I don't really feed a egg anyway. Yeah, I don't think there's a problem with it so long as, you know, again, you're just monitoring the animal size. I think there's a lot of people, like, it's a lot of people in, who have mentalities of, like, <clears throat> you know, oh, yeah, you want to keep your animal well fed, and it's like, if you don't, you're neglecting it, or they have this mental block of, like, Oh, I can't not feed this animal today. Like, you know, you think it's a terrible thing, but you know, sometimes they don't necessarily understand like how, what the metabolism is like on some of these animals. And um, the last thing you want is a fat tree monitor. Right. Another reason why people have struggled with breeding in the past. I mean, you want, you know, your males, at least you want to be pretty lean if possible. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, having an approach of kind of like less is, is better um, is good. But once you get them to breeding size, you just want to really monitor that because a male can blow up so fast. But yep. egg is fine. I mean, I'll offer it like egg for me is kind of like, a, you know, I do a lot of crickets. Um, that's kind of what my, you know, crickets and quail is like my primary food sources. Um, but when I get into a moment of like, I am low on, um, you know, if I run out of crickets and, you know, some animals don't eat roaches, I mean, I have dubia colonies and I do have a grass, you know, some grasshoppers going, but, um, if I run into that moment of like, oh shit, I don't have enough to feed all of these monitors. Um, I'll whip up, you know, a couple dozen eggs and everybody's getting eggs for the day regardless. Right. Oh dude, I feel you on that too. Yeah. I am, uh. I'm, I'm at this point. So my roommate breeds, um, rodents, mainly mice now for all of his snakes. Cause he has a shit ton of snakes. Um, and I will sometimes like grab a few mice, but I'm buying like four or 500 day old quail every three months right now. Mm -hmm. I go through a lot of them. Um, it's, it's, I basically just 
kind of how I do my feeding is I will, um, I will thaw of a shit ton of quail, like one or two mice. And then the females that I really want to get like weight put on to, I'll feed the mice to, and then I'll follow it up with quail and I'll feed them basically to the to capacity of what they're willing to take. And then once they walk away and won't take any more, then I'll drop 10, 15 dubia in a cup holder. And then the male will pick out of that and maybe the female will the following day. And that's, mm -hmm. that's just kind of how I do my feeding. So mm -hmm. I got to ask you, Cody, who you get your quilts from Adam Slayton. All right, bro. I think I can beat those prices. Let me know. Shout out to the sponsor Blake. Oh yeah. He's, Animal he's Peter. very comparable. He's a cool dude. I hit him up on Instagram. Seriously. Well, man. I saw your, I saw your thing for him. What's the price for quail out of curiosity? Listen, we can't discuss this right now, Brian. Relax. I, 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 it's very sure. well. Okay, we will <laughs> we will talk. Okay, because listen, he he's looking for his first handful of customers. I've I've yeah. been I've been I've been like his guinea pig for like the last six months, and he has it down. But he's looking for yes. he's looking for his first handful of customers. Let me let me can I link you up? Maybe Brian and Cody or Cody's already talked to him. Yeah, yeah I talked to him. No, he's a cool dude. I basically where I'm at is I still am sitting on three like 250, 300. So I, I'm going to figure out pricing a little bit better when I get to that point. But he had very good pricing. So I'm, curious, curious, what, I'm curious what the pricing is. If it's like compare, you know, I got my homie Ray out there. Nobody knows about Ray. <laughs> unless I've told you. Where's Ray? Is he out in your area or where's he from? He's out. Yeah, he's out in like Kentucky or Virginia, somewhere out there. Uh-huh. Right. He's my guy. Right. Nice. Well, Hell yeah, you're, guy, you're good. You know what I mean? Then it's about yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. And my guy, the reason I'm I'm like shouting your guy out too here is because the guy I usually buy from is like, hey, I'm kind of at capacity for what customers I can take. Right. So instead of referring people to him to get told no, like no. But if the price is right, if the price yeah. is right, I'll jump. I mean, right. Blake Exotic Animal Feeders, hit him up on Instagram. Yeah, man. Let me know that him they sent you. I'll connect you with him, Brian. Maybe maybe you guys can work something out. If it works. Yeah. I it works it works you know what i mean great might be great now but no it, it, oh, and that's sorry, why i, I breed geckos solely is to feed my yeah. tree i don't want to do it literally <laughs> sell geckos to buy monitor food, food, right? food geckos. yeah <laughs> no hey let me uh let me grab one of these hatchlings quick i'll see if i can get it to eat on camera i'm down hey listen brian how much how much now, how, what'd you say i think sleeping right now who's sleeping Dude, yeah my, my lights are about to go off so they're, they're not going to be. Oh, they're knocked out. They're, 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 they're meat. Yeah, they're probably hiding. How are you going to find one? I'm curious. Uh, they actually sleep out in the open. What? So. Mine, mine are gone. Like mine, mine are out for a certain point of the day. Once they eat and they're good, they're they. they I never see them for the rest of the day. I actually got two of them in my hand right now. <laughs> hey, uh, Brian, how much uh, quail is being fed to your babies? Your babies eat quail quite often, or none at all? Pretty much 100% crickets until they get to like eight like months old. Eight months. Okay. Yeah, for, for me, it's like uh, I will do grasshoppers only until about a month old. And then after a month old, I'll start doing like occasional like cut up pinky mice, um, scrambled eggs, stuff like that, just to get them used to having a variety at a young age. But it's yeah. still mostly grasshoppers. Oh, man. All right, Cody, you're getting the big screen, buddy. Yeah, but uh, I did wake them up, so they probably don't want food, but we'll see. Nothing. Nope. Try this guy. Yeah, they don't. They don't give a fuck about anything. Oh, he wants it. Oh, my bad. He doesn't know where to bite it from. There he goes. Yeah, that was gnarly. Yeah, and they just no cares. Can't do that with any other insect, Brian. Okay. <laughs> that is so cool. Cody, do you worry about the hind legs of the grasshoppers with digestion with them? I was actually going to say something about that. Thank you for bringing that up. So, I the only... I've noticed bloody stools from it, and I've seen photos that people have taken... Yeah, Spotlife posted I those. the hind legs on all those grasshoppers, especially larger ones. I mean, the little yeah. ones, I don't think it's a problem. But like that size, you don't, you're not worried about the hind legs? So this size, they're pretty soft still. Okay. Um, it, when they get to that like last instar right before they're adults, 
then I will actually like pull the legs or snip them, uh, like especially the adults. Uh, wow. But at that size, I don't worry about them. They're fine. Oh, that's I didn't know that. That's I guess that's something to be worried about because what, what can happen? Well, happen dude, man. Dude, MJ, yeah, come on, MJ. Hey, hey, dude, you, I'm here to learn. Go, hold on, go I'm pick here up. To learn. I'm here to learn. Go pick up one of your adult female grasshoppers right now and don't pinch her legs when you do it. Let her boot you in the thumb once. It Tell hurt. me how that feels. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, I and not bleeding though. I think yeah, I've, oh, I've, I've bled from insides, it. though, man. I've seen, like, literally bloody stools early yeah. on when I was doing that. I'm like, okay, those hind legs have got to go. I've, uh, I've never seen I've, that. I've, That's I've been kicked hard enough that I bled a couple times. Um, yeah. So, basically, it and it's I really only think it's an, an issue with, like, the, the like I said, the, the like, sub-adult, like, that last size before adult and adult. Um, I got, yeah, I got, like, no, they, I got they, no problem. I got no problem ripping these fuckers' legs off. Trust me, that ain't nothing. They, they come off like fucking like it's butter. You know. Yeah, what I mean? But yeah, if if like if the animal eats it backwards, the the barbs are gonna go like this way and poke into their throat. Whereas if they eat them front, the barbs are gonna go down. I guess this way, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it, it'll go down a little bit more smooth. So then they don't worry as much if it gets digested right. But that's all. I think that's all like super hard keratin, so it doesn't digest fully, so it, it can like bulk them it, and shit. It's almost the same thing because oh. haven't you ever heard people of losing a snake because supposedly the fucking rat nails or something caught something as they were digesting it? You would say it's mm-hmm. almost kind of similar to that, right? Yeah, I, I would say, yeah. And and so like yeah, like if you're feeding like small, medium, or even large size grasshoppers, I don't think you have to worry, but it's like that XL size, I call it, or the adults. I clip the legs. Or usually if you just hold them by the legs, they'll detach them themselves. It's yeah, little, I mean they usually a little yeah. gruesome, but <laughs> I gotta say, man, that was that was impressive with those babies eating at this hour. Oh, epic. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, they were they were literally sleeping in the door track in front of the enclosure. They looked like they, they looked right like they up. were asleep. They looked like yeah, cute they were. babies. Like just like oh, what's going on? Like, oh hey dad, what's up? <laughs> they were fully asleep, dude. Yeah. I they don't give a shit, man. This is uh, my most social clutch that I've had yet, for sure. All so five of them, just though, one man. after another. It's yeah. so interesting. I, I do think there's really something to, like, every, like, there's definitely species that are more, and pairings that are more predisposed to having, like, calm offspring. So but Some of them, I find that it's not the case. And, and granted, I have not produced any greens <clears throat> i don't have any animals that are old enough i mean all mine are babies um i mm. kind of greens were the last species for me to get just because i figured they would be the easiest ones for me to attain um mm. but like you know and i'll also admittedly say i do not put in the amount of work that you do into socializing every animal just because of the i got extra time the scale, man the scale of the operation that i have with everything here is, is a bit much but i do feel like a lot of my blues, even if I tried that, they wouldn't have it. Some of them, sure. Some of them, sure. But the majority, I'd say there'd maybe be like candidates of like 10 to 15% of the offspring that I produce maybe could be candidates to get mm-hmm. to that level. Right. Of, of film, <laughs> thinking out at night. I don't even know. But it's like black. I, I can literally pet the top of their head their yeah. back i can pick them up by their tail they don't give a shit dude yeah. um yeah. but no that's what, that's why i prefaced earlier there's going cody or is it just uh, that one pair uh for the greens it's just the one pair i want you to get some other pairs going first of all because so, well i mean especially if they're as nice as that pair that you have because that mm-hmm. baby that i have from you is the most be- in contention for the most beautiful animal in my collection for oh, tree yeah. Um, yeah. But secondly, the reason why I want you to do that, there's a couple of reasons. I'd be very curious if other pairings would be the same way. So uh, what's funny, I I, it, I actually messaged Nick and asked him if I had permission to bring this up. Nick from mm-hmm. AP. Um, so he's produced blues, right? And I went to his house before Monitor Fest and was playing with some of his babies and all of his uh hatchlings are bat shit crazy like mm-hmm. and i'm like okay so this is how i do it and and it's so funny not to not to call him out he's fucking awesome um but i like snuck my hand into the enclosure and just like eased it towards it and got my hand up under it and lifted it up and he was like i've never held that one 
And, uh, and I'm like, I want you to do me a favor. The next time you have babies hatching, I want you to try to do to a T what I do with my hatchlings. If you have the time and I'm like, just tell me when they're going to be hatching. And I'll just kind of like walk you through what I do. And he did it. And he said, this is the e most easy going they've come out. Cool. So wow. yeah. Cause I've, I have one pair in particular. I've got three pairs of blues that are breeding and one of them, the babies are very calm and trusting a, a good chunk of them. I'll say mm -hmm. my other pairings, they are very, very skittish. I mean, crazy. So I, I do, I mean, they definitely each have their own personalities, but um, I wish I had the time to dedicate to doing that. Right. I'm not on your scale, dude. The only thing I'm doing is tree monitors right now. My roommate does all the snakes. I do the tree monitors. Mind you, I'm doing like 3d printing. I'm starting to do like wholesale, like cork bark and shit. I'm not cool. doing a thousand geckos and all that. So, yeah. and like I, I dialed back my daytime job hours. So I have way more time to do this shit. So Ooh, like nice. most of what I'm doing is um, like, honestly, the grasshoppers take up more time than anything. Maybe we can but, work something out. Maybe I could <laughs> sell any baby I sell. I can offer the option. I say, Hey, here's the deal. It's like people who want to do dog training. I say, hey, for an additional you know, $250, you can pay directly to Cody. You can send it. I'll send the animal to him. He'll keep it for a couple months. Cody's <laughs> monitor training program. That's funny. Any so animal that's trained, it'll sit, stay, come, heal. I, I feel called out here because literally, so mm -hmm. I, I sell my greens for like $2,250, right? Mm -hmm. um, if they're super social, I sell them for $2,500, and I just say pet well, quality is Captive bred, and that's the other thing you want to talk about, like breeding stuff. I know, like obviously, I know you said that you've gotten some animals that were wild caught or imported. And mm -hmm. My female green is had success with that, and I, and I have two with, um, you know, one of my blue females. That's my mm -hmm. pair of three animal, which ironically enough is the animal that produces the more calm babies. But um, I will say that, um, oh no, where am I going with this? Damn it. <laughs> Train of thought. thought. Um, what are we saying? No. Uh, uh, getting him like confirmed. Uh... Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I will say that it is, it, it seems to be a lot easier for the animal to, if not captive bred, at least if it wasn't import, if you had it as a baby, because mm -hmm. otherwise they're just these like super psycho skittish animals. Oh yeah. The female is bolting every time you walk into the room and she sees you. It, it, what I'm going with that is it is the extra, you know, $500 or whatever. Like, I mean, you see, I, I saw ill, nasty looking greens that were on death's door being sold for like, you know, 1500, 1500, yeah, dude, 500 all day. If, if this animal that I have from you somehow turns out male, um, I'm going to be knocking on your door for another female and I'll happily give you. Okay. That, oh. that works for me, man. No, that's actually funny. MJ and I were talking about this before the show, though, was basically what you're saying there of like, um, even with my wild caught animals, um, like with my pair of yellows, it's more so the male, to be honest, that I work with just because he's easier going. But I try and like put in so much uh, extra effort and hours into socializing I, it's really not even socializing. It, it's just like desensitizing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I put in so many hours to getting them as comfortable with me as possible. So that way, when I need to tawn feed more often to get a cycle going, she's not going to run and hide. And then I just have to sit food out to rot. Right. Um, it's easier to, to pack food onto females. I can work in the enclosure, set up nest boxes, do all the shit without them freaking out. Um, and so that's one of the main reasons why I'm like so invested in like the, the socializing aspect is because I just I just want to make them as calm as possible so that it's easier to work with them because they're it's it's a win win for sure. Yeah. Uh, I think that can be to play devil's advocate, though, to that. The only issue I see with that, like I would love to have those animals be calmer, but I look at it as like having, you know, Doing that work with that female is definitely adding a layer of stress on her. And oh, if, for sure. If, you're, if your intention is to breed and if your intention is to like get this animal acclimated, to me, I try to be as hands off as I can with that animal 
Um, I can see that for sure. Because I don't like, and not only that, if you're getting an imported animal, I also very, very strongly suggest that you need to be treating them, especially if you've got other captive bred stuff. You know, you have to do sometimes a couple rounds of treatments, which is a pain in the ass. I mean, that's the other thing. It's like people out there could go ahead and maybe find a green for 1200 bucks. But by the time you're done going to the vet, and you're putting oh, in the, every other day jamming yeah, the the and, 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 and shit. Metronide yeah. is all down its throats. Or if you're having to do panicure, you're doing that. Potentially, you're going through that first round. And then sometimes you don't knock everything out and you want to do it again. It's a headache for you. It's stress on the animal. It's extra yeah. money for medication. You're better off paying the $2,250 for the captive bread. Green. And not only that, people will go ahead and trash talk like, pricing of captive bred animals i just want to say like keeping tree monitors especially a large collection is expensive oh, yeah. when you look at keeping other reptiles if i wanted to go ahead and just focus on um a monetary aspect i would be doing geckos and i wouldn't even be doing um, if, right or snakes or, or anything i could if you look at one enclosure of my tree monitors how many different cages i could fit in that space now take into consideration the amount of lighting, you know, I've got two different lights going on in there. I've got this massive space, the amount of food that it takes to feed that animal, the amount of time, like tree monitors are expensive to keep alone. Yeah, man. Period. Yeah. Compared right. to no. and snakes. So uh, I've heard, you, um, you charging I, 2250 or even 25 for a green, I think is more than fair. Mm. No, I, and I kind of, what I try to do to be honest is, I, I go like, hey, if I'm seeing multiple wild caughts at 1500, I'll go 50% above that and then add 250 for it's social. So that, that's kind of where I get my price from. I want to say, though, if, if you have a problem with captive born and bred prices, I don't think that's the right animal for you. I totally, right, totally. I, I think you are in your head trying to save money anywhere you can. And this isn't a save money animal. Like, it's not like, wow, how can I keep this like, low budget no dude that's not this isn't that type of animal like if anything you should be finding more ways to make it more expensive <laughs> which is like you know obviously we you know we're not all made out of money but dude this is not the animal to be mr fucking budget you know not only uh, that, if you do go the budget route and you buy that animal at 1200 let's say um you know and it ends up dying then what where are you that's yeah. 1200 out the hole and now you've got to get another you're getting pretty close to that point anyway now you now you might as well have just gone captive bred so in, in the big scheme of things, and again, like, you know, I saw someone mentioning what kind of geckos, right? Like leeches, kahua, cresteds, gargoyles can go for well over, like, I, I charge 3K for captive bred blues and yellows, um, which I feel is very reasonable given totally. the fact that there's really not even many people consistently doing it. But right. if you look at prices of other reptiles out there, that's cheap compared to them. And tree monitors arguably are more expensive than to keep than any other species that at least I work with. Um, so it's like when you see lychees going for 10 grand or five grand or Kahua going for that kind of money, it's like tree monitors are cheap in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And, and yeah, on that point from earlier too, about people complaining about captive bread pricing, like, I, I've gotten some flack about that recently from somebody saying it's just some random dude, but like, oh, you're just trying to line your pockets. Like, you know, if, if I'm out here buying new cars and shit, like I, I would I would actually be all ears to hear that. Um, but every time I, I sell a hatchling, I'm buying six months worth of food. I'm buying six months worth of lighting. I'm buying new enclosures like I'm literally just investing all of it back in the animals. Like I don't I don't pocket any of it. It's just, yeah. It just goes back into them. Now you will, what you guys say the beauty the beauty about what we work with, and not to be a dick, but we could fucking pick whoever the fuck you want to sell these to anyways. So like, if you really want to be that guy who's fucking wondering about lining up your pocket, bro, I don't give a fuck what car I drive, and I don't care what prices my shit is. Fuck you, like I don't. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's why I, the nerve of some people. You know what I mean? And, and mind you, these are people who aren't busting their ass taking tree monitors, taking care of tree monitors like you guys are probably. You know what I mean? They don't. They have, they lack the experience, but yet here they are speaking on it. You know, it's mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying. Like, um, one of the biggest fucking kicks in the ass that I dealt with, and I understand it is what it is. Is you know, I had this this super door for tick project, right? And I had these prices that I thought that I had needed them, and then next thing you know, 
somehow a lot of my productions ended up on some random person's table at this reptile show and they were like all wholesale price like i'm talking fucking cheap I'm, I'm trying to stay as far away from that as possible that right yeah you think i'm done after that i yeah. was like fuck this shit like i'll i will do everything in my power to make sure this will never happen again and if i have to stop breeding this shit i'll stop breeding it i don't because at the end of the day it really isn't about the money i want to i want to hold value to this because it's Dude, I fucking work my ass off to keep all this shit going. And then if the see mm. this shit happen, all because of the saturation in the super dwarf market. Everyone produces super dwarfs now. So it's like, and I kind of did that to myself, but man, I just don't see that happening with tree monitors. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah, there's not enough up, people man. producing them. There's not enough people producing them. Yeah. And I think that's gonna change. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot more stuff being being produced in captivity, which is awesome. And eventually, you know, if we get to that point where, you know, we'll see what happens with pricing and, um, you know, it'll be interesting. But, I mean, at Daytona, when I was down there, I brought my animals and, um, you know, there's there a lot of blue trees there, um, a lot of wild caught stuff. And honestly, it was, it was really sad to see because there was full grown adults and like large size deli cups that were just sitting there that were on death's door. And it's like the more people that are producing captive bred stuff. I don't know. I, I think even if like, you know, they're going to get, you know, the quota is going to get met. People are going to still keep catching these things and sending them to different markets, you know, around the world. We're not the only one. We're definitely a big one. But it's like, um, you know, depending regardless of what happens with pricing, they're going to go to another market where somebody else wants them. And it's not really until like Indo itself does something, you know, mm -hmm. stuff with like the mm -hmm the legislation for blues to get listed, um, you know, on the Endangered Species Act where they would not be able to be transported across state lines. Like I could see that going with any of the smaller insular species, maybe not greens because they are from the mainland and they've got a bigger range. Huge um, number, yeah. But like why, why stop, you know, the captive propagation that would essentially shut that down the same amount of tree monitors are still going to come out of indo just going to different markets and you know like and, and a black market so it's kind of crazy like something needs to happen in it and i don't necessarily think it's like it, it needs to happen through indo it is really interesting Agreed. no and it's funny you, you mentioned daytona though because i literally said a few days before daytona like i would be willing to bet thousands of dollars that i don't have <laughs> that there's going to be a, a large number of blue trees popping up at daytona because this esa act is going to scare the shit out of people and everybody's going to be trying to dump their blue trees uh just because they're scared that this is going to go through not realizing what it means and mm -hmm. and lo and behold there's just like way too many blue trees at daytona and uh it, it's crazy and i'm seeing them online like i saw a couple guys selling their long-term captive blue trees for like a grand just trying to ditch them real what? quick and, like oh, yeah okay. like yeah, but they're yeah, right. hot and in rough shape i mean that's the that's what what i saw at daytona like the animals i saw is the type of thing where someone would buy it bring it home and it's dead in a week mm -hmm. i mean it's just like that's yeah. a time like and honestly like I wish all shows would curb that type of thing, you know, would like would stop that. I wish they would police it, walk around and look be like, hey, that can't be here because hopefully that would stop that that could aid in stopping some of that crap from going on. Agreed. But, um, there was another man, a Jason. Um, I'm forgetting his company name. I don't know if it's Tri City, but he he's produced blues and he had some beautiful animals at the show. Nice. As well. Hell yeah captive bread so um you know he had those and we were kind of right across from each other so but good number of tree monitors there but some rough looking mm -hmm. specimens that actually uh something like that happened at the fall tinley where i first met you at you remember we were looking at the table that had all the black trees and then yeah. that one pair of blues and uh we i remember we both looked at them and i even asked hey would you separate and just sell the male and they said no and i'm like all right they know this female's gonna die and I don't know, 30 minutes later, I see this kid walking down the aisle holding the tubs. And I was like, hey, man, have you kept tree monitors before? And he's like, no. And I'm like, <laughs> these are awesome looking animals. Take my info. Please get them to a vet ASAP. Let me know how they're doing. Um, I still keep in touch with the dude to this day. He's really cool. His name how, is are the animals alive? Female died two days later. Like Male that, still great, not, man. That is not like that puts a scar on us, and like mm -hmm. that is not good. 
Yeah. Was- yeah. That female died almost instantly. And like, we called it even just looking at her at the table, like yeah. her hip bones were way the fuck out. She's just like emaciated as shit, super dehydrated. And I'm just like, how do you even have this animal on this table? Well, let me, well I got to ask you guys this. Okay. The fact that you guys are dedicated by this project and the whole talk of self-policing all year, this has been going on, right? Like, let's say we're at a show. Let's say all three of us are at a show. And we're all hanging out. We know there's a couple tables with this bullshit on it. Is it too much for us to go over there and be like, yo, what the fuck's up with this? And and as as being breeders who are successful, talk to these people and be like, and, and try You're to get slow, man. Huh? It, it, it is a slippery slope. And, and a lot of, a lot of it, I was I, I just want to chime in quick. I was gonna say uh, a lot of it too is just they don't only deal with tree monitors, they have all Every, the shit on their table. So they're just gonna go, I don't fucking care, walk away. This is oh, this is just table. Off. Off. Yeah, that's you know, if you've ever been, I've been at some shows where you see some vendors who are going at it. And next thing you know, like fists are flying. I'm not trying to get in. I don't that. want to be a part that's of that. Up to, that's up to the show. That's up to whoever's putting on on the show. You know, mm-hmm. if Potter or Wayne want to go through and check on those folks or, or or hire people to do so and designate that, I think that would be good for the hobby. You know, we're doing a lot of these auctions you know, for us arc and putting forth a lot of effort to try and like support our hobby. I think another way of support, I'm not knocking, you know, they've got a lot on their plates. They got a lot to handle, but I think it could be something potential for them to look into. Um, And you see some show promoters doing this where, you know, they, they are, you know, and they're policing it. Um, You know, if you go to like, even though it's very small scale, early startup, flora fauna conference up in New York, um, Gabby put on, I mean, That is like, if there's something bad looking, it's out. I mean, it doesn't even make it to the table. I was going to say, I don't even make it to the events. Like, I don't think that, that, yeah, that event is so prestige. It's, I can't, I'm I'm going, it's in May, right? Is it every May? I think, right? Where is it at? It's in New York. It's up in London, like upstate New York. Okay. It's fucking crazy. It looks so baller. I want to go. I cannot, I'm going next year for sure. It's devil's advocate on that. It's yeah. like a, oh, sorry, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, like a weekend getaway with reptile people is what it is. Nice, hell yeah. Um, Uji, Uji, no, I was just gonna say devil's advocate on on you know what you were saying about Potter if they want to take that into their hands. There are so many goddamn vendors, and you know, That's what I'm saying. thousand times the people they can't keep up with all that, and yeah. so I can't you know, hold that against them for not going to every single table and going, Hey, this animal doesn't look right. Plus, do they know what a healthy looking animal from every species looks like? Like it's, it's, it's probably a people who, who and I, and I, I don't know if you heard me correctly when I was mentioning that I said something that they potentially could hire. Oh yeah. 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 Oh, oh, okay. I didn't hear you say that. I mentioned specifically Brian and Wayne have their hands full with a lot of things. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 Amazing shows. This was by, you know, but not, this, this, not anybody. I'm just saying it is something that we, if we're talking about policing, it is yeah. something that we could look into. I mean, oh yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things that I like about my local show too. Is like in Omaha, it's 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 growing, and but it's still small scale enough to where the 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 guy that runs it, Glenn, um, he's very involved. So if I go to him and I'm like, hey, this is bad, and he will go look at it and be like, hey, take that off your table. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's nice. And luckily we are like a close knit enough co- community. I think I've only seen that happen one time in three or four years. So it's, it's nice um, that people can actually hold themselves to a decent standard, but I, I, I can totally see where that would be like, you know, do they have the resources to hire somebody to go around yeah. to do something like that? At but, not, but, but not only that, like what, what's going to come down sure. to it, like let's, let's just say they do, right? Let's just say, oh, wow, policing's happening. Well, guess what? It's going to come down to politics because yeah. now now what's going to happen is someone who does have a fucked up snake or animal at their table, they pay so much money to US Arc or they do this where it's like, all right. Mm-hmm. We're gonna we're gonna let this one. Stay. Hey hey man, if you start policing what animals are allowed, you're gonna get lumped in with Darian real quick. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, animals are allowed, but it's like any breed, any any sort of person who's been in the game long enough can look at a table and can tell if there's an animal that's on that store. Mm-hmm, yeah. True. That's all there is to it. I'm not saying like, oh yeah, you know what animals allowed and what isn't. If it's an ill animal. That's yeah. you know, looking dead. And if you're if you're doing a show that's captive bred only, 
it's pretty easy to tell yeah. if someone has a bunch of imported animals. Oh yeah. There. Oh, I'm I'm totally agreeing That's with you. I, yeah, Potter I'm totally Wayne agreeing with you. To be, you know, it's again Potter and Wayne have their hands full, and uh -huh. they do a great show. I mean, I've been going to to Tinley for eight years. I've been vending that show. Yeah. No, Brian, right. he's you know they put on an amazing show, and it's a lot to handle, but. You know, again, if, if we're sitting here talking about us going around and policing, that's not the way to do it. The, no. promoters, the promoters are the people who would have to do that if it were to happen. Yeah, I'm, glad, no. I'm, glad, I'm glad you said that, Brian, because I want to ask you this question. Why don't you like the West Coast? Like, I'm just curious why you want It's the logistics, man. You know, shipping animals out there and then having to ship animals back. It's a lot of risk. Uh, it's it's Florida, Florida people do it. Florida people do it. I know. Other people I, know. I guess I just have not <laughs> mustered up. I haven't mustered up the courage to do that. Well, just come hang out. How about yeah, that? How about, leave, how about leave your fucking animals where they are? And just come hang out. Just, just, just show yeah, yeah. Your I'd love to. That would be a too, to Cody. Do that too. I've I been need, needing to. I need my players over here on the West Coast. Okay, that's 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 what I'm trying to. Just, that's all I'm trying to say here. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Now, overall, though, let's just talk about show like Tinley. You're just giving mad props to Tinley. Um, Brian, but what what would you say? What show you rely on the most? Is it Tinley? Like, is Tinley the show that you rely on doing the best all year, or is it not that not the case? I wouldn't say I like rely on them, but I I enjoy like my show lineup now is I do Tinley in March and October, and I've been doing that for years. Um, and then I've added in Daytona, um, and I'd like to do um, you know I'm going to try out some of these Reptilian Nation shows. Um, there's one in Atlanta, West Palm that I'd like to do as well. I'm doing the Flora Fauna. So I can yeah. do kind of around like six shows a year, you know, um, you know, I, I wish that, um, with a lot of these like Repticons, I wish they were advertised more. That's like my only mm -hmm. issue with them. I think they, they have potential to be really good. Right. Um, I think more advertising would really help. I think getting people through the door is the key. So the shows that I try to go to have a lot of traffic going through um, through the doors. But I do, you know, a lot of the a lot of the online stuff. And I and I will mention too that, you know, with the tree monitors, it's funny. It's like I've been producing them, you know, year long, you know, for the past two seasons, very consistently. And you'd think like, man, if somebody wants one, they'll reach out. Like, you know, but having them there at the show and people seeing them, um, it's a different thing, you know, a whole different see experience seeing them in person. It really is. And out of like the four, I, so I ended up selling four at Daytona, not a single one of them went home with the customer. I still have those animals. I made sure like checking in with the customer, like, Hey, you don't have a cage ready. That's fine. I'm going to bring them home with me. Oh, yeah. Get everything set up. Show me pictures of your cage. And then after we're good to go, I'll send you your animal. So I'm sitting on all the tree monitors that I sold at Daytona. And that's kind of how I want to do it. Like I'll bring them. If people want to pick up like, hey, I want that exact one. I like those markings. That's cool. I will totally do that. But I, I really want to see your enclosure set up because, I mean, I turned down a sale at Daytona as well. There was a couple who was they were fresh in love. They're sitting there, like kind of like holding <laughs> hands, looking at it. And he's like, Well, what do you say, babe? Like, we, you know, and they're talking. And then I hear him say, well, We got that 40 gallon enclosure at home. And I'm like, Hey, nope. guys, like, here's wait, 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 what do you say? He said, What? I got this. You got that 40 gallon that nothing's in. And I just, Oh, I, hell no. <laughs> it was like the record skipped, like, boop, boop. and I popped in. I'm like, Hey, guys, like, look, if you have one cool but here's the process here's how we're going to do it like this cage and i brought a cage set up exactly how i would set up my babies i'm like you're going to want this style cage set up like this if you want a baby we'll do a deposit now set it up send me pictures and we'll go from there and they you know they ended up backing out after that which was cool with me you yeah know? no totally I, I, th I definitely think you set a great example was doing that too, honestly. Like that's kind of why um, after I saw you do that at the fall show, um, I, I wasn't even, they weren't even for sale, but um, our spring show here in Omaha, I brought a cage just to show them off. And mm -hmm. so I brought the whole enclosure with me and everything just for people like wanting to see them and shit. And that's how I want to do it going forward to is branding enclosure and be like, Hey, this is what you're going to want to set it up. in. I feel like I do a pretty good job of vetting people that are, that are interested in buying at this point. And I'm like, these are my, my minimum requirements that I ask of you. Um, and, and I want pictures to show that you have, you know, this understanding, this enclosure set up this way. Um, and yeah, I've, I've had a, 
quite a few sales where people were just like, well, I guess I'm just not buying from you then. And I'm like, that's fine. I, mm -hmm. I could not give a shit less. I just don't. I, Dude, I've had five or six of the animals that I've sold now die um, just from. Oh, no. Yeah. And five I've only sold five out of over six. 13. So, Say that again, Cody, I'm so sorry. Five out of six, what? Five or six of the 13 that I've sold have died. And from wow. escaping bad husband uh, and, you know, some supposedly good husbandry but turned it out bad husbandry like pretty oh, high mortality rate so i'm just like i'm sick of this shit i'm gonna i'm gonna start vetting people like crazy i i'm i'm not gonna let you throw it in an, i don't care if it's a three by three exoterra I'm, I'm not gonna let you have an exoterra anymore it has to be a pvc enclosure with a locking front door that's not gonna pop open on its own randomly um because two of them have escaped and either gotten lost or um or otherwise, I'll leave it at that. Uh, but you want to hear something sad real quick? And I, I can't get into specifics, but since we're already on a Debbie Downer right now, I'm going to make it even more depressing. All right. Jeez. There's a pretty legendary lace monitor breeder out there who, like, literally lost five baby lace monitors because, because they all escaped. Um, and it's probably the most depressing thing. And mind you, he's had lace baby laces in these exact enclosures. But what it was is he installed a Miss King system. Okay. Oh, and they popped the fucking nozzle out. Yeah. Holy shit. Damn. That right there would be, I don't know what, I don't know how I would recover from something like that. I really don't. Well, mind you, because I can't even imagine seeing a baby lace in my hands. Like, I just, I, like, fuck. That's bro. crazy. But, but what's crazy, like, it happens to even the most legendary people. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and it's something that's not easy to fucking deal with, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah Josh has one of my hatchlings. I know his is, his is doing well. Yeah. I heard of a horror story when I was down in Daytona. Um, I'll be back. I could I could keep keep talking. I'll be right back. Yeah, there's somebody had a, a clutch of blues that hatched out, weren't you know? And and fire ants got into the facility and into the cage and killed all the blues. Oh shit, dude! No, I'm, way. I'm so grateful that I don't have fire ants where I live because no I way. Heard that story with so many people of different species, and it's just like. If you live where there's fire ants, you've got to be so careful. I mean, what a terrible thing to happen. That's insane. I never even considered that being something to worry about. Yeah. God damn. Oh, the one of the one of the worst ones that I had, and it, thankfully, like just worst like interactions. Um, thankfully, I didn't sell to them. This guy messages me and he goes, "Hey, I'm interested in buying." you know, uh, one of your hatchlings or putting a deposit on one. I had just gotten one from Nick Gill and it, and I had it for a week and it died. And I'm like, why, a, why are, why are you telling me that in the first conversation that you've had one a week and killed it? Um, but also B, how did it die? And he goes, Oh yeah, my cat broke into his exoterra and killed it. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, so did, did you get rid of the cat? No, I'm not selling you one. <laughs> Was that simple? Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I mean, shit like that can happen, but it's like, yeah, you got to take precautions. Yep. Take that was, uh, I, I definitely am not going to name names. The dude is a very, very cool guy. Not that one. Um, dude's a very cool guy. But you remember that post that I made, MJ, about, uh, hey, can people send me pictures of hatchlings that I've sent out? Yeah. Just so I can get an update because... You know, I, I just found out one of mine was like being cared for very poorly. Parker yeah, yeah. ended up Parker ended up with it and and it's doing yeah. phenomenal. He brought it back um, to life in a way. Yeah, yeah. very much. Um Shout to Parker. But I tagged somebody in that post and I'm just like, Hey man, can you post pictures of it? And he never said anything. Um two months later he hits me up and he goes, Hey dude, I, I don't know what the timing was of that post and you tagging me, but literally within an hour of you tagging me in that my green that I got from you got out in my garage. And when I was looking for it, I set a box down on top of it and killed it. Oh, no. No. Oh, Literally. Dude, so you – okay. You know, I was talking about how my blacks would just jump out, right? Yeah. So literally – and this could happen to me. I, I have my – I have them on top of my tree monitors, which is six-foot cage. So I have to get a stool to go up there, which yeah. I should probably change that. But when it flew off, I jumped down the stool. Because I thought oh, I you thought, almost stepped on the I was fucking thing. stepped on it. Oh okay? no. I was like, I, I like like I'm like, here's the monitor. My foot was like right here, like when I landed. And I was like, oh, oh shit, you didn't move. Cause I thought once it once I, I didn't even look. Once it flew out, I thought, oh my God. And so I just it's jumped on. Yeah. 
and it was right there at my feet. But dude, I could have easily oh, put this fucking size twelve. Terrifying, fucking, dude. That's why I was like, "This is." I was like, "I'm not. I don't want to be Cody today." I was like, "Fuck this shit." I was yeah, like, trying to be Cody, dude. I was trying to be Mister. Here, my hands a branch. You know what I mean? Yeah, dude. No, and so <laughs> what? Like when I have friends over and like I'm showing off the babies, I even say like, "Hey, I'm gonna let this out. Nobody move your feet. Don't. If it jumps, I nobody take a step." Still. <laughs> so because and luckily with mine they're like so easy going if one does manage to jump if it hits the floor it's just gonna like turn its head and fucking stare at me like hey bro pick me up <laughs> like Dang. so Dang. yeah i nightmare and like i said the dude that uh that it happened with he's a very cool guy it it's very unfortunate circumstance but yeah he uh he killed it um <laughs> which is fucking insane I mean, we're talking uh, about all, like we're, we're talking about all these precautionary things, like you know, he, you know, if it's an import, take it to the vet or all. The, but then we also put put away the fucking freak accident type of things that could happen too, which like mm -hmm. easy, like not on purpose, but like keep or neglect by like stepping on it or fucking dropping a box on it when you're like, oh my god, did I just do that? And yeah, I, I I cannot, and this is the reason why I'm like I'm still just like he's a cool guy. I cannot imagine being him in that situation i cannot imagine the like the the depression that he went go or that he went he through realizing he that he that. killed it he didn't it, sleep that night he didn't sleep no that. no absolutely and that's why i'm like he didn't do it on purpose i know his caging was fine he literally like was yeah. taunt feeding it and walked away and didn't close the door and came back and it was out on the floor and i'm like i get it man that fucking blows but i get it so he wants, wants their animal to die no. no fuck no 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 not at all um and that's why that's why it's almost that's like kind of like a, a shittier way for it to go out like i understand you buy something and it's like oh wow it's sick and it died but when it happens on on your hands it's like well, yeah it's, it's a bad feeling yeah i mean you i mean but also you should i mean not i'm not saying beat yourself over but you should, kind of should feel beat up over it a little bit because yeah. it's fine you know but that's fine like it's you know, it's, it's, it's going to happen, unfortunately. And uh, I don't know, Brian, I, I know since, so, just so we can make this whole depressing talk a little bit better. Uh, <laughs> is there anything that, that you did like, like similar, like, Oh my God, what the fuck? Like any, what the fuck freak moments happened with you in the tree monitors? Not no. with tree monitors, but with other stuff for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Something is something as simple as, as holding an animal, you know, you've got it in your hand and it jumps and your, re, you know, your reaction is to reach out and grab it and actually taking your hand as you're grabbing it and slam it into a cage and KO it. Oh, no. What the fuck? Oh. And, then it's like, and it happened so quick. And like, and then I was just like literally holding this animal. And I'm just Knocked like, out? I just said, like, what the fuck just happened? Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, my it was God. Like, it was like Gecko. I was holding it. And I'm just sitting there. I was like taking a photo or something. And it jumped. And I just reached out. And it would be like if I went with my hand just ping into the glass and just like knocked it out. Oh. Luckily, luckily, it survived. Well, it was crazy. out cold. It was out cold. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. And Mike Tyson did real quick. Bop. And then. Nice. <laughs> the main reason I, I'm willing to say shit like this, though, is because people don't realize like, hey, I can get away with this exoterra. I can get away with this. I can get away with that. 90 well, I, I will say like basically all but one of the hatchlings that i've found out that i've sold that have died died somehow related to a fucking glass enclosure really so what like what you? like escaping or something of the sort um and so that i i just bring that up just to be like just buy fucking pvc dude don't right. cut corners yeah but it's like any i i feel like there, there's definitely don't get me wrong if I am recommending a cage to someone, it's PVC for sure. Right. But the other day, I mean, I, actually, when I was, I think I was down in Daytona, I had a clutch of yellows that hatched a week prior, a couple weeks prior. And um, my friend, who is like currently has built my whole room, it's, it's mm -hmm. like very, very grateful for him, Joel. Um, he's sitting there and he tells me, hey, Brian, I walked in and there's a little tree monitor sitting on a piece of cork against the wall. Like, huh? So I end up like, whatever, getting it back. You know, he gets it back into the cage and everything. I'm like, okay. I'm like, out of curiosity, like, which one was it? Send me photos and everything. And sure enough, it's these young hatchlings. And I went ahead and got it back in the cage. I'm like, dang, cage wasn't open. He like checked. There was no cracks, no nothing. 
And uh, the next day, there's another one out. That son of a bitch. It's got to be through the glass. And yeah. sure enough, with these PVC cages, if you've got the glass that overlaps, so you have one that will slide, you know, or slide, mm -hmm. um, there's a tiny, tiny little gap. Yeah. And the babies were getting through this tiny little gap of the glass. So for some a new, weather stripping, some no. babies, sure, weather stripping, but like, you know, sometimes it, it's not an issue. But if you have babies that are, you know, super small, they can, they can get out That's of anything. That's crazy. Yeah. That's so crazy. I, I actually had, um, and, and in all the, the self praise that I'm giving myself for PVC cages, I thought I had <laughs> lost one the other day. Um, of, of the fight, dude, I, I, I'm telling you, sorry, there's fucking fungus gnats all around me right now. <laughs> I, I bought new plants and I'm just- You cannot see them, them, so you're good. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just boxing the air, dude. <laughs> but um, no, the uh, every time I close the door, I have to go one, two, three, four, five. Like, make sure they're all in there because they will just headcount. fly out and up. I got to make sure to do a headcount every time I close the door. And I know I did it this time. Yeah. I, I knew for certain- and then I'm like, it's 5 p.m. I'm only seeing four. I'm like, all right, let's check back in a little bit. 8 p.m. Only seeing four. Next day at noon, only seeing four still. And I'm like, motherfucker. Damn. So I, I tub four of them. I start pulling branches, nothing. Sifting through the bedding, nothing. And then uh, I'm like, all right, well, I guess I got to tear all the cork panels off the wall. So I pull the lid off of it, pull this whole right wall off, nothing. Put all the cork panels back up. Did a couple on the on the back. I get to the back left corner. And there's this tiny little crack in the corner and I can't feel anything behind it. So I'm like, I don't know if that's it, whatever. So I start taking them off the top. I get like halfway down and I shine my phone with a flashlight down there and mm -hmm. I just see the nose sticking up. It got in behind the cork panel and wedged behind it, but it was so snug it couldn't get back out. It was completely it was stuck. It could have died in there then. Yeah. Yeah. So I tubbed wow. that one too and I went in and spray foamed all the seams because nice. I didn't do it the first time around for some reason. And uh, yeah, it's good now, but dude, I, I, I pulled that thing out and its eyes were dilated and it's just like, whoa. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. I was confused. Like, dude, I thought I was dead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it was thirsty. It, it drank for a minute too. But... Now, for, for anyone out there is thinking like, well, what's the big deal with glass enclosures for a monitor? Why don't we kind of like break this down for why it's not ideal for tree monitors to be in something where they can't climb the walls? You know what I mean? If you cork the walls, you know, if you silicone cork panels to the walls, it can be all right. But then normally you're also dealing with screen top. Yep. Screen is a problem. You don't really want to ever deal with screen with tree monitors just because it's a good way for them to rub their face. PVC, yeah, PVC, yeah. PVC is 100% the way to go. That being said, um, a glass enclosure, if it's set up right, can be used for the short term. Yeah, raising up, raising you up. raise up your baby but you really got to be on your game and making sure everything's set up properly exactly I, I i mainly just say no glass because it's easier to say no glass than sure glass but you have to do a bunch of extra work so it, it's yeah. just easier to say no glass um because yeah you have to try to seal part of the top to trap humidity and trap more heat because there's way more ventilation you have to not build the walls up as high so that they can't reach the the lid so then they can't climb on the screen and there's just there's a lot of extra work to it and Wait, i mean and it's, sometimes it's like, the doors don't latch right and fucking you name it it's too much work for like you know where, where it's not necessary i feel like you know right especially, yeah especially if you want to do things right now mind you we're saying if you're asking how to do things the right way we're telling you right now this is pvc is the right way because of these exact reasons you know what i mean and i think any any breeder you talk to I, I would be shocked if you came across someone who's producing tree monitors and they would not hold on to the animal long enough for you to get the proper cage totally yeah there's a lot of people yeah. that have the glass cage and they really want to make it work and like if they send me photos of the cage and it's set up proper like okay that's a good temporary cage that's a pass but otherwise, it's like, I'll just hold it until you get your cage. And like a lot of these companies, the lead times have gone down now. I mean, I use all animal plastic stuff yeah. and they, you know, they produce a lot of really, you know, really good caging for tree monitors. It works awesome. Um, you, you can't beat computer, computer cut and made enclosures, right? 
Mm -hmm. that, that CNC does work. No, I two of the five hatchlings that I have right now are are being held on to for people that have orders in with AP that are just waiting for their enclosure. So yeah. I totally hear you on that. I agree. This is the first time I'm ever hearing anything, something positive from animal plastic. Oh, dude, I love animal plastic. Really? People just, people just yeah, shit on them because of their wait time. You, no, they can't help that they have a big customer base with only three people building cages, right? Well, like, I think I think it is, it is it was the wait time, but I've actually seen like a rack, like you know, for when I'm talking monitors, I'm talking like for like a snake rack, right? It, it's like a fucking god, it like wobbles. You oh, know really? What I mean? So anytime I saw User that, error. User error, they built it wrong. <laughs> oh, I mean, I use AP racks for all the geckos. They're great. Um, and all my cages, man, they're great. It's I love AP. They that's take great care of me, and their cages work awesome for tree monitors, and that's, like, pretty much all I'm using right great. now. That is all I use for my tree monitors is AP products. They've got um, a 3 by 2 by 2 um, that I use for the babies. And then, um, you know, I've got different setups for my adults that, you know, they're four by four by two, um, you know, stack side by side, um, with, with doors, you can turn it into an eight wide by four mm -hmm. tall, um, nice, yeah. also some other cool stuff where I've taken two four by four by twos on top of each other and actually created a door going from the bottom. Oh, nice. Heck yeah. Ooh. Yeah, I need to get. I need. I'm in the process of getting some some videos up of those cages. But that'd be uh, really cool. Well, I don't think you've, I don't think you've been in front of these type of cages yet, here, Brian. So um, really? I've been wanting some of those. We got those conjures. I've been wanting to try those cages. I will say I'm all about the quality of PVC, and mm -hmm. and I pay close note to this because I had a custom enclosure built for me by a so-called company that wanted to launch and do their own thing, and they kind of used me as a guinea pig. So I was like, fuck, if you if you could build me an eight foot tall, six foot across, four feet deep PVC enclosure, fuck, okay, bring it on. You know what I mean? Mind you, they did with the cheapest fucking PVC that you could find. Yeah, like and, Home and Depot I, shit. Not even Home Depot. You can't Home Depot was luxurious compared to this shit. This shit, <laughs> this shit was like foam. Like, bro, like if I Damn. dropped it, if I dropped it, it broke. Like if oh like, yeah. Let's say, I if I, let's about. say if I dropped it flat, it would it would crack. And I'm like, yeah. Bro, I dropped a hammer. I dropped like not 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 far. Like I'm talking like the hammer fell off the stool and it and it fucking put an imprint in the, the PVC. And I was like, what? Like this is terrible. So yeah. after that, and like I said, shout to sponsor focus. But man, I I could just really touch PVC and tell the quality of it. And, and oh yeah, and fuck with it. And not, mind you, I don't I haven't seen your cages, so I, I can't really talk on animal plastics. I've never seen an actual animal plastic um enclosure like what you use, Brian. I'm only going based off the one rack that I saw like five years ago. Um, so really it's all case by case, but I, I'm just, I pay note of, you know, notes of all that shit now. And mm -hmm. one thing that stands, one thing that keeps focus cube away from a lot of other people is their quality of PVC. I think. Yeah. They, they use a way higher quality. Um, if you look at the cross section of, uh, of the side of a PVC, if it, if it has like, basically if it has bigger holes on the side of it, it means it's more aerated. So then it's not as dense and focus cube has like really dense PVC. So it's higher quality. Yeah, for sure. I'll also say too that for me, like I have to have glass doors. I do mm -hmm. not like any of the plastic acrylic and shit. Yeah, doors. I'm not game for that. So if any cages I have, like I will not do any sort of acrylic doors. Thanks, Brian. Brian. Monitors hanging with claws and get scratched up over time, and that can warp. You know, glass. Yeah, the the heat blows it out. Yeah. No, for me, um, I have. Uh, a couple two by two by two enclosures from AP. Um, I had the T8s and stuff that I kept boas in. Um, I had a three by two by two that I started hatchlings in, and now I'm I'm doing a three by two by three, which isn't very cost effective. It's like twenty bucks more to do a three by two by four, but this is the size that I wanted for the hatchlings. But that's what I'm doing those in now, and I have two of AP's four by two by six. And I'm not a gigantic fan of those. I, going forward, I'm just building my own adult cages out of, out of PVC, so because I, I can source like the sheets myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm building my own adult cages, but basically everything else I'm getting from AP. So I like their stuff a lot. Yeah, and they're great people to work with. Oh yeah, Allie is the most ridiculously happy person I've ever spoken to in my life. Every time you call in, rambunctious and. And happy to talk to you, even if you're yelling at her. Where are they from? Where's AP out of? Uh, an hour away from me. They're in the oh, west of Des Moines, Iowa. So anytime I need something, I just drive over there and pick it up. Des Moines. Yep. 
Yeah, beat the shipping, dude. If you're near, uh, and this is what I always say for any company: if if there's a reputable PVC manufacturer, if if they're close to you and you could drive, if they're willing, go and pick it up. Beat the freight shipping on it. That's one thing, you know. I, I get hooked up by Focus, but fuck that shipping, bro, always hurts. And I'm like, God yeah, damn it, man, like this shit was literally like half the price of what I'm paying for these goddamn cages. I'm I'm paying like 50 percent more because it's goddamn shipping you know what i mean yeah and there's nothing nobody can do it's a guy it's just the, the rates the rates are just their enclosures are so nice though did, uh, did yours so did it. yours come with the heat panels in it and like the purchase yeah. and everything or did you do yeah. all that yeah so the way they the way they, they give you two options right they're either sending to you all boxed up ready to go like mm -hmm. this and it comes all fucking bulky or or comes, like flat packed yeah. so yeah. they flat packed it but with the everything already pre-drilled but then also the panels are already drilled so the panels are already on there nice yeah that's for for being like and and i will always tout ap i think they're great but for being a like arboreal snake specializing in closure and having all that shit you can't beat that yeah that, it's fantastic yeah now since we're talking about enclosures this is a little wrap-up topic that we're going to close things with here um you know one of the biggest talks with the reticulated python community is like you can never give it a big enough cage and that's kind of true like these mainlands like you know you see what tom crutchfield does on outdoor stuff and it's like it is pretty luxurious to see such a big animal just roam free in such a big enclosure now if we're talking about these tree monitors okay if somebody out there wants to go all out like let's say they're just like hey i just want to keep a pair or a group and i don't care about breeding i just want i want to give them something so crazy is that something that you could get away with as well like like, is, is there no size limit to a tree monitor enclosure you feel like? There's you no know? size limit at all. No size yeah. limit at all. And I would agree that bigger is better. However, mm -hmm. the biggest thing about that is you just need to make sure your requirements for heat mm -hmm. and humidity are being met. Yep. So as long as all of that's being met, give them a bedroom if you want to. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. I wish everybody could do that. Agreed. Uh, you know? So, so long as you're meeting those requirements sure do it yeah yeah no and and my only input on that is i could see the reason for going a little bit smaller because smaller means less variables means more control. easier if you're trying to breed yeah more control so i could see the reason for it but in a in a perfect world we would all be doing gigantic room-sized enclosures i'm trying to get to that point every time i build an enclosure i, I make it a little bit bigger than the last one yeah. um but no it's it's it, it and it definitely makes shit harder for me, and and I know that, and I'm willing to try to work through the kinks of figuring the shit out. So, yeah, I just know that these motherfuckers would use every inch of that, no matter how big it is. Oh they, yeah, they, they, and they they'd still be glass surfing trying to get out. <laughs> I just I admire their, I just admire their agility, man. Their agility, the way I mean, I can only imagine. You know, I don't know if any of you guys actually see a tree monitor in action in the wild. But I can only imagine the way they jump from maybe from tree to tree or from branch to branch if they need to or if they need to get away from something. Like these motherfuckers will go. Like they're Chris they, Applin got some pretty cool videos of that when he was on the Chris. Chris is out of UK or is he from Australia? I can't remember. UK. UK. Damn, shut yep. up. UK. I, I would think though, if I ever were on that type of time where I'm like, I'm trying to go bigger, whatever, it would be outdoor. I, I would I would want to do that outdoor because I'd feel like you know especially in san diego and whatnot obviously i would have the winter to worry about but like summertime mm -hmm. everything I, what's there to really other than obviously giving it some shade and then exposing giving it all the options i mean that like like if we're talking bigger better it, it, you're, you're probably better putting it outside if you could get away with it like in florida or in san diego you yeah. would say right Brian? I, I, go ahead what do you think I, I think that um the biggest thing you need to be careful of like in an ideal world yeah, man. If I lived in uh, in Florida, and I, you know, if I if I lived somewhere along the equator, I mean, screw it, man. Put me down in Colombia. I'd rather live down there. If I could like <laughs> sell animals anywhere, I'd love to be down there. Um, the biggest thing you have to worry about is is predators, and that includes yeah. like in my area where I am, I've got black bears, fox, <laughs> bro. Oh, yeah, you had one break into your car, yeah. didn't you? Oh, dude, he <laughs> I could talk on that for a minute. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't even process what Brian was showing me. I'm like, dude, did a fucking tweaker get into your car or something? And you're like, no, <laughs> the fucking bear, bro. And then apparently your car reeked, right? Did your car smell like this fucking bear or some shit? Yeah, I they. I mean, I especially this time. Well, right now they're kind of chilling out because a lot of the trees are going to seed so like there's a lot of acorns being formed and hickory nuts so like the bears are kind of leaving they're kind of disappearing and going to the trees and um but there's you know the last month the last two months every day 
every day. And even now, I say it's gone to like every other day that I see black bear. I mean, I but I live up in near National Forest and it's like out in the boonies. I mean, um, but back to what we were saying, you have to be very cautious if you're doing outdoor enclosures of predators. And that includes anything from a bear to an ant. Um, you have to be very, very careful about that. I mean, I've heard, I was, I think you were taking a bathroom break, MJ, but everybody was saying, uh, or I've heard a lot of people have horror stories about fire ants. Um, I do keep a group of animals out here, not tree monitors. Um, but some of the animals that I keep are outdoors during part of the year. And I have two different levels of mesh. So I have like your, um, it's like a metal mesh fabric where it's super small holes so that something like a weasel can't get in it. But then on the outside of that, I have actual chain link fence going all the way up to the ceiling um, over the roof. So it's like got double layer of protection from anything again, from like some sort of little weasel up to a black bear and knock on wood. I haven't had any bears get into it, um, which is great, but you have to consider those sort of things. Cause yeah, in an ideal world, if you lived in the climate outdoors would be amazing. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, from talking with Vanessa too, I can say a lot of people that live in like South Florida don't always take into consideration. They're just like, Hey, outdoor enclosure. And then they don't prepare anything indoors either. Yeah. So when it does manage to hit low fifties and then they're just like, Oh, I guess my animal's going to sit in a tub until it warms up. Like that sucks, dude. Yeah. Or they'll provide a hide box with a heat pad. I mean, as beautiful as that sounds again, unless you lived in that environment that was like consistent. And again, if you look at Papua New Guinea, all right, you look where all these tree monitors, that whole complex of islands where everything's from, it's very consistent. And, you know, one of the things you were mentioning earlier, Cody, that I do not do, I don't mess around with light schedule. I do right. 12 on 12 off. And that's exactly right. what it is in the wild. Um, mm -hmm. They're not going through periods of time where they're shortened light cycles. Um, and, the, and the temperatures are very consistent. The main variables that you have along the equator for a lot of equatorial species is mostly your rain cycles, um, dry periods. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of more things that I focus on. But again, hey, something works for you go with right it. oh exactly and, um, and my understanding was uh during fuck, what, september through <clears throat> like november december is there like winter in in that area um and from my understanding it does get marginally colder there um <laughs> they don't lose many light hours but from my understanding it they just didn't get the high heat peak of the day um mm -hmm. so it it might have been a couple degrees colder at night um, and that's one of the main things that I've been trying to do recently more too, is just instead of trying to, um, completely kick back my day temperatures, just drop my night temperatures further mm -hmm. and just doing that's made a difference to be honest, like just stopping them from being at 75 during the night. Like if I drop it to 68, I'm seeing could, more breathing from it. Could, could yeah. it even sprain more trigger something as well too? I think 100%. so. 100%. Yeah. Because yeah. you're you're by spraying more, you're cooling them off, right? And and, it, and you know if there's overcast from clouds, that's causing uh, less heat. So then, might be. So would you say you'd want to spray more during their winter time, or during their winter time is when you'd want to apply more water, or is it just kind of? I don't know, nor do I think there's really anybody out there who has the data in the wild as far Agreed. as when stuff is breeding out in the wild. Um, you know, I like that info, but <laughs> I, I don't think I I don't think that exists at the time being. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, precipitation is a huge factor. I mean, um, and and you know, and kind of back to what you're you know talking about that outdoor enclosure situation. The beauty of being indoors, though, is the the ability to to manipulate. You know, you can manipulate a lot more things better than outside, whereas you're kind of mm -hmm. like you're out of control. Yeah, you have no control what happens outside, obviously. Yeah, and that's that's one of the headaches that I'm seeing Vanessa run into too. Is all of her animals that are laying eggs are doing so between September and April. Nothing's happening, or maybe even October and March. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing's happening during the the late spring and summer because it's too hot, and so she has to like try to force more shade and do all this extra stuff where all of her stuff breathes during the oh, like tree monitor wise. She's getting the most success during the like 
fall, winter, early spring months. And even if you just look at tree monitor forums, dude, um, people in like Northern States, the second it starts hitting that like early part of the winter, Oh, Hey, my animals are locked. Watch the forums in December, January. Everybody's going to be talking about how their animals are locked that have never locked before. It's because their house is getting colder uh, during the night because they're now experiencing winter and the, the cold drafts coming in. Potentially. So that, yeah, Potentially. That, Potentially. Fair. Uh, but, and that's what I've played with. And uh, all of my females that, like, that I didn't stimulate anything crazy from, like changing any variables um, other than just the winter, um, and they're in the front room of my house. Uh, and this front room just has the craziest cold draft and the floor gets like 55 degrees during the winter. Um, all the enclosures that were in that room, my female yellow, the black tree, all of them cycled at the same time. Um, just wow. from the, the, the temp drops at night. Well, Cause you, you created, a, you, cre you created a season within your own room. Like that's yeah. why, that's why it happened. Right? Yeah. And it's only totally different at night, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, and no, it's totally fair to say pot uh, potentially. Hypothesis. Yeah, totally. Because I can't prove it, right? I can't say definitively. I can't give like a paper on it. But that's what I'm running on. Yeah. I mean, from, my, from the pairings that I have going, I mean, I'm noticing copulations year round. Um, nice. No, that's I've awesome. We got production occurring year round. And I think, but I keep everything very stable year round. Mm -hmm. And every room has its own temperature you know climate controlled situations yeah. so and, and uh, even even with your heating brian your heating doesn't change either right everything stays the same for what it is right yeah yeah i mean i i, I literally have you know temps set up on auto for my room so it doesn't matter the time of year the temps are the same yeah. what do you keep i know you have a panel for your tree monitors right and do you keep that at a certain i don't temp? really I, I I was doing heat panels at, at night mostly. That was just to provide in case the room got too chilly. But now You're with good. my current setup, I'm kind of just doing more regulation of the room. Um, um, you know, and, and everybody, you know, everybody does things different in different temps. You know, I, I don't, I know you're going to have, you know, you, you'll have Brandon on here multiple times again. And Brandon's a, a amazing source of knowledge i know in the past he was doing and you know he can he can correct me on this if i'm wrong but i believe he had kept his monitor room at around 80 um and he had a lot of success with that but i don't know like how much supplemental heat or what exactly he had in his cages at that time i know some things had changed so um you know again given like i'd love to get some data on what these animals are doing in the wild when they're breeding. Totally. When, and I bet you a lot of these people who are, you know, unfortunately catching these things and, um, you know, sending them to exporters, you know, they probably have a lot of information as far as like, you know, Hey, what time of year are you seeing babies? Um, mm -hmm. Oh, totally. Yeah. Be interesting. But again, I think the way that they're catching those animals I don't think they're necessarily catching babies. I think one of these one of these motherfuckers who are catching these tree monitors has to have an Instagram or Facebook. We gotta find one of these people. Right, dude. Yeah. I'm Some, telling you, like, to be out there I just don't think it's legal. I don't think that they legally can be doing that. Yeah, but they're gonna do it anyways. I mean, so they're gonna do it anyway for sure. And I think <laughs> once they're in, once they're in a certain like, I would love to hear more about it because this is all just uh, uh, you know things that I've heard, but like. Apparently, I don't think it's legal for them to be doing that. But once they're in like a different destination in Indo, they can ship them out or whatever. Right. Um, There's the poles. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck, man. I don't know, and that's just, that's what I've heard from some folks. I don't know the full. My my understanding from having spoken to some importers and exporters, because I did get in contact with some people over there, is um essentially they have a wild caught quota and then a captive bred quota and they're they're kind of seen as two different things and and they can uh increase the number of animals that they're capable of sending out to the u.s if they're claiming their captive bred which is where the term farmed is coming from and so they're allowed to catch x amount of these um the like green trees or blue trees but they're given a very small number and so by lying and uh conflating that they're hey they're actually farmed and i bred them blah 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 
they're they're sending out more than they're supposed to. So that's the illegal part, as far as my understanding of it. And the captain, a lot into it. I'm sure just simply females that they're catching that are gravid that are laying eggs. Yeah. Or 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 just it so happens they've been holding on to them for X months and they're like, oh yeah, it's been here a while. It's captive. And you would think you would think if there was a facility over there that was like legitimately breeding them, which I wish there was, and I hope there is. We would know. Future, you would think they'd be posting photos of that stuff. You'd be seeing it every. Yeah, yeah totally. Uh, no, I I totally agree. Yeah, it, you know, it would be, it'd be nice. There was one guy I used to follow pretty heavily on Instagram, and I haven't as much and i don't even know what he's up to now but there was Bambi one guy Gretno? no <laughs> Bambi, Bambi. yeah Bambi. yeah see yep i Bro, knew that's what you're gonna say no shit where i'm like what is that and he's just like yeah like like it's nothing yeah here's and my you know crazy t negative albino water monitor when they weren't even a thing over here and like exantix and all that yeah yeah, bro. I heard, but I heard that guy is like into like some bad shit. From uh, I, heard. I heard he stammed somebody out of a bunch of money in the U.S. for some like exanthic water monitors and shit, and then just went ghost. And then he did. I heard, but I heard I don't know what the sources were, but I heard he did some shit to that in his own hometown, like to his own people. Yeah. And, and so they're after him or some shit. From what Too I heard, bad. I, don't, I don't fucking know. But he had a cool fucking Instagram though. Yeah, he sure did. Um, fuck, man, what a time. But listen, this was a great podcast two hours went by super fast uh before i let you guys go um cody i'm gonna go with you man anyone out there who's looking to approach you and possibly become one of your customers what would you have to say to them what what, what do they need to get in a row um you? uh hit me up on facebook or instagram buy an enclosure beforehand PBC. preferably pvc <laughs> <laughs> PVC. Um, all of these hatchlings that I just hatched are spoken for already. Um, Dang, but, yeah, Dang, they have been for a while. I got a few that are hatching in November. One of those is spoken for. Um, hit me up about those. Uh, my Instagram is riser with two R's. It's R Y Z R R. Yeah. I'll put it in the chat. It's in the, it's in the description below. Also, both both oh, are, nice. in the, are in the description below. Um, um but yeah. But, but yeah, that or Facebook, I don't mind either way. But yeah, dude, and and any questions on shit too, even if you're not buying it from me, I don't, I don't mind answering questions. So, fucking right. hit me up. Awesome. Now, Brian, anyone out there who's excited to inquire one of your beautiful produced tree monitors, what do you want to tell them? What would you like them to know beforehand? Yeah. Um, well, first off, I can be found Instagram, Facebook, and my website, sundownreptiles.com. Shoot me a message. Um, I do Tinley Park NARBCs, uh, you know, again, Daytona every year. You know, those guys got some of the biggest shows in the country. I need to get out to the West Coast but for now. Um, you know, those, those shows, the NARBCs and, and the Daytona NRBE is where it's at. Um, and uh, yeah, kind of like what Cody said, get your cages ready. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want quality animals that are going to be healthy when you get them, you don't have to worry about treating them for parasites and whatever else, you know, um, go captive bread, even if it's not from me, um, you know, right. just get it from somebody. So yeah, exactly. And if you want yeah. that, if you want that stamp of approval, meaning this is a handleable tree monitor, God, you gotta <laughs> Dude, hire me to hire me to give it doggy daycare, right? <laughs> exactly. Cody, Cody's uh, tree monitor training program. Um, yeah, Cody, you can figure out your prices what's, for that. But yeah, that? I will be at Dayton. I'll be at uh, Tinley Park next month in October, and I'm gonna have blues and yellows there. So if you want to see one in person and you want to talk to me about them, pick one out. Um, we can do that. But again, you gotta have your cage ready before you bring it home. So, I um, yeah. And guys, I will be I'm, handing off uh, two greens at Tinley next month, actually. So I'll have some with me. They're just not for sale. So will you have your grasshoppers there, Cody? Yeah, I'll have grasshoppers, and uh, I've been doing some photography prints and shit, and some three cool. D printed stuff. So I'll have all that. Just no, uh, no tree monitors for sale. They're all spoken for. <laughs> hey, but to be honest, one thing that I've said before, um, I did like a show review, and I and I thought to myself, like, you know, it is awesome to sell an animal at a show, right? But think about how many people. You know their intentions aren't to buy an animal, but they would like to leave with something. Like they want to take yeah. something. Oh having, yeah, having like photos and stuff like that's huge. Totally. Like I think, and and mind you, like that photo could lead to them going someday and buying something from me because they stare at the photo every day and they're like, you know what, man, it's I came to this table five years ago 
and I didn't want an animal, but dude, I, I'm really interested now. So it's just like mm-hmm. le- having somebody leave something with anything from your table, I feel like is very important. Oh yeah. I, and like, you know, it's, it sucks that I, I'm not producing on Brian's scale. So I, I don't have enough animals to bring to, to Tinley and stuff with me um, because, you know, only having four or five every three months, they sell online pretty quick. But yeah. it's also nice that I can say, hey, my animals sell in line and then I sell husbandry and, and other stuff at shows. So I'm fine with please it. Tell me, please tell me you're holding, you've held some back. Yeah. Okay, good. Yep. <laughs> the last time we spoke, you said you haven't held anything. I'm like, no, oh. I, I, okay. I'll, I'll fess up. <laughs> this clutch is the one that I'm holding the one back from. <laughs> good. 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 All right, gentlemen. Dude, I, I've just been wanting to build cages, man. I, I let them go for a good cause. Yeah. I'm going to be hitting you up. Old. I'm gonna be hitting you up, Cody, because I want I want to see what you have going on with your uh, your side businesses, your cork stuff, and then uh, yeah, other you have going on. So we'll talk. And uh, Brian, Cody, thank you so much for spending your night here with us. Um, and, and I appreciate both of you guys, everything that you do, all the knowledge that you guys spread. Uh, two very impactful individuals, and I gotta say, thank you so much. Enjoy the night. Uh, but guys, do me a favor, give it up for Cody and Brian, ladies and gentlemen, on this first episode of Tree Monitor Tuesdays. All right, guys. Have a good night. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Cody. See you guys at the top, man. Yeah, later, later, man. Peace. Woo, man. Thank you guys so much. What an amazing episode. I'm definitely going to watch this back tonight. Lots of information. And just be ready because more of this to come. Um, Tree monitors is my thing. I'm not going to lie. Monitors in general, but tree monitors, my thing. Guys, if this is your first time tapping in, do me a favor. Hit that like button if you enjoyed tonight's episode. If you thought it was worthy of a like button, hit that. All right. And then hit subscribe. Um, so you subscribe to this channel, okay? Hit the notification bell, select all. You won't miss any of my episodes that I drop here. And I want to say thank you for all the love and support, okay? I'll catch you guys here Thursday for an Elite Ball Python talk. Getting back to ball pythons because I know that's what you fuckers like. Um, but seriously, it's going to go down. So thank you again, Brian and Cody. Episode 383, it's a wrap. See you guys Thursday and I'm out. Cheers.